meeting of the Committee on Energy of the Commission on Appointments in the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. We are resuming the hearing, which was suspended yesterday, December 6. May we hear the report of the Majority Leader on the parliamentary status? Yes, Madam Chair, Your Honours, yesterday, December 6, 2022, this committee deliberated on the ad interim appointment of Secretary Rafael Perpetuo Lutilia as Secretary of the Department of Energy, including the sworn statement of opposition as well as the supplemental sworn statement of opposition filed by Mr. Pete L. Ilagan against the ad interim appointment of Secretary Lutilia. The letter of Representative Mark Wanko. Chairman of the Special Committee on Nucle Nuclear Energy was read and made part of the records and proceedings of this committee. The oppositor, Mr. Pete Ilagan, was given the time to discuss the opposition against the Alpointi under consideration. During the deliberation, Representative Rodante Marcoleta raised some policy issues and inquired on the appointee's direction being at the helm of the Department of Energy. During the deliberation, however, because of lack of material time and upon motion of this uh, the, our majority leader without any objection from the members of the committee, the committee suspended deliberation on the appointment of Secretary Lotilia as Secretary of the Department of Energy. That is all for the parliamentary status, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Majority Leader. Today, this committee will resume the deliberation on the ad interim appointment of Secretary Rafael Perpetua M. Lotilia, a secretary of the Department of Energy. May we call on the appointee under consideration to take the designated seat in front. Secretary, good morning. The chair would like to remind Secretary Lotilia that he is still under the same oath. So let us continue, please, uh, where we left off. The chair recognizes Congressman Rodante Marcoleta who was previously requested to continue with his inquiries on policy issues pertaining to the Department of Energy. Just also for the record, the following members during the hearing last November 29, not yesterday, have signified their intention to make a manifestation or raise an inquiry from the appointee under consideration. I would just like to put it on record, and if they will continue to ask after Congressman Marcoletta, let it be known. But if they have withdrawn, let it also be known. Senator jo, uh, J.V. Ejercito, Senator Bongo, Congressman Manuel Sagarbaria, Congressman Fridge uh, Biron, and um, Senator Cheese Escudero. That is a list I have, but we will tackle that after Congressman Marcoletta. You have the floor, Congressman Marcoletta. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. May I seek your permission that I sit here because I need to establish an eye-to-eye -eye contact with the uh, Secretary. Maybe this will expedite the proceedings. Yes. Uh, the closer, the better. That means the closer you are to him, the closer we are towards his confirmation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We beg your indulgence, uh, Mr. Secretary. Good morning. Uh, these are very important policy issues that we need to articulate because we believe that this will ultimately bring down the cost of electricity in this country, which is the promise of uh, the president when we were campaigning together. And this, is, uh, this can be witnessed by uh, the Madam Chairman, even uh, Senator Jingo is not here, but uh, even the Senate president was there when we were articulating this promise that resonated well to, uh, to the public. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Secretary, we have somehow agreed that the uh, PBR is not a globally uh, accepted methodology and our country is not even a signatory to any treaty to that effect. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, I think you will be agreeable if we work on getting or reverting back to the previous methodology, which is ROB. Are you amenable, Mr. Secretary? Uh, if Congress uh, desires so and uh, makes the revisions, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I think even uh, the Congress intervention is not even needed because under uh, Section 43 of EPIRA, the ERC has the option of resorting to any uh, modality or methodology. So it's only a question of 
reverting back to the former because this is more realistic. We will be doing away with uh, the plans. Actually, we will be using actual investment, not planned investment, to free our consumers from paying the plan uh, development or investment that is yet to be installed by a, a, uh, a, a, a utility, which is impractical, uh, which is not realistic, because the Supreme Court already ruled that any expense charged to the consumer by the public utility, which does not relate to the services of benefit accrued or derived by them, is unjustified and equitable. That is a Supreme Court decision. So if you agree that we will work on that, then uh, I'll close that uh, particular issue. We commit to work with you on the, this. That is an undertaking, uh, Mr. Secretary. Yes, uh, pursuant to the APRA, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so maybe we will be expecting, Madam Chair, uh, a, uh, a particular, uh, maybe circular from the DOE, formally advising the DRC that we are getting back to that and work on the details and set into motion the proper mechanism for us to migrate again or revert back from PBR to ROB. We will expect that, Mr. Secretary. Accordance with the APRAS, uh, Mr. Yes, sir. Thank you. And maybe uh, I'm committed to that because uh, under PBR, they're using the WAC and, and ERC failed miserably, and I think they forgot and slept on their duties of computing the work, and therefore the distribution utilities had a windfall profit from merely 6.8% to about 15%. I think we need also to work on whether or not the transmission fees and distribution fees collected from the consumers should uh, probably be refunded somehow. We, we, can you undertake or commit that we can work on that, Mr. Secretary? Definitely, we can work on, on Thank that, you. Mr. Thank you, sir. But, uh, of course, in doing this, uh, you might earn the ire of uh, some industry players. Are you ready on making uh, some of these people unhappy? More especially uh, the players with whom your good self at some associations. Are you prepared to get the ire or making them unhappy for many times? Uh, we commit to do that, uh, Mr. Madam Chair, or so want to appear. Thank you. And I assume yesterday, um, Mr. Secretary, that you agreed with this representation when we discussed the uh, inappropriateness uh, of a system loss being collected from our consumers because it cannot be justified in any manner. Pilferage of electricity, errors in computation or accounting or whatever cannot be the burden to, to consumers. Uh, can, you, can you undertake to work with us? Uh, some part of it should be worked out with Congress, like we would have to knock of that provision in Republic Act 7832, Section 10, where system loss was instituted. I, on my part, Mr. Secretary, will help you because I have a pending bill, so that I, I would secure your support on that. Of course, we will make, again, a distribution, distribution utility very unhappy, but I assure you, Madam Chair, that we will make our consumers very, very happy. Will you commit on that, Mr. Secretary? We committed to work with you and the Congress, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. After all, again, in, the, in that case that I articulated to you, the Supreme Court said that rate regulation is an art, reaching a result that will be good for the public utility, for Miralco, but best for the public. So in balancing uh, the interest of the consumer and that of the electricity provider, I think there is a more weight on the part of the consumers considering the underlying and overarching objectives of EPIRA, which is to provide affordable, reasonable, fair, and transparent rates of electricity. Are we agreeable on this, Mr. Secretary? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. 
I also assume uh, in yesterday's hearing, uh, Mr. Secretary, that we had an agreement that uh, the ARCOA is supposed to be pursued with more vigor because this is one way, this is one mechanism of bringing, reducing the rates of electricity. This is something that the ERC also is left for some time. Can you imagine that the EPIRA provides that the ARCOA rules should be there three years after the effectivity of the law? You're very sure about that. Uh, Madam Chair. But it took them 11 years to work on the rules. Kaya hindi natin na maximize. There is also a provision in the EPIRA, Madam Chair, of aggregation. I am correct. That's right, Madam Chair. And the threshold is only 700 kilowatts. The rules on aggregation, Mr. Secretary, were only issued very recently. So it took them 21 years. Medyo mabagal sila talaga. That is why, since yesterday, I've been urging you, you're soliciting you, not only to draw the line, but cross that line. Do not be afraid. We will help you. Uh, because you will be working. You're crossing the line not because you want to fight them. You're crossing the line because you want to serve the better interest of our people. You are agree with me. You are with me, Mr. Sp Mr. Secretary. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. In the ARCOA, Mr. Secretary, merong naging problema. Like, uh, for example, an electric cooperative in Antique, where uh, the Madam uh, Secretary and uh, the Madam Chairman uh, had the uh, and the, uh, the residence. Kapag ka po nagkaroon ng ARCOA, necessarily, nagkakaroon po ng contestable market. So yun pong, uh, yun pong provider, yun pong uh, energy supplier doon, nawawala po yung market niya. Uh, one by one, may kumakalas po because of the contestable market. Now, the electric cooperative there is burdened by the stranded cost or excess cost. He has no other alternative because of the fixed agreement. Ang nangyayari, Mr. Secretary, ipapas on niya doon sa market na walang ability to go into the contestable market. Kaya sila po yung nababarden. Ganito po ang marami. Can we work on that to rationalize uh, the PSAs or the PPAs on the new in order to justify uh, the rates of electricity without compromising the viability of the electric cooperatives or the distribution utility? We can do that. And you will undertake to do that, Mr. Secretary. C certainly, Madam Chair. We will work on, on Thank that. Thank you. In, in, in connection with that, meron pa kayo ngayon bago, ito yung tinatawag yung DES, Distribution Energy System, which is more or less like the ARCOA. Wala pong provision pa ngayon yun. So, siguro, kung bago pa ito, i-institute nyo na rin for the purpose, again, of rationalizing. Kasi po yung distribution o yung DES is more attractive to the well-ups kasi pwede siyang maglagay po ng... Uh, Solar panel, kayang-kaya niyang bayaran. Yun naman pong ordinary individual household, wala naman pong kayang gumawa nun. Kaya dependent siya doon. Siya po yung mababarden because of the DES and the ARCOA. Please situate that the rules are amended to rationalize to keep everybody or to make everybody happy. We can do that, Mr. Secretary. Certainly, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we discussed yesterday, uh, Madam Secretary, that meron kayong existing DOE circular issued in 2018. Uh, this is in particular relation to the guidelines on uh, power supply agreements or PPAs. Dito po kasi nilagay ninyo under section 7.2 or 7.3, I'm not mistaken, yung pong DOE and ERC 
are mere, obs are mere observers. In other words, you are now uh, incapacitated to take actions on anything that will ensure or protect the interests of the consumers. Sana mapalitan natin yun, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Secretary, because this is a very important issue for you to be able to cross the line. It, it might help you uh, not just to maintain or draw a line between you and ERC. Again, I solicit your attention here. Maybe we can do this and we will help you do this also. I'm sure we can revisit that. Thank you. Before, uh, before Congressman Marcoleta proceeds on the next point, um, on the issue that you raised about the electric rates in our province, uh, for the information of Kong Marcoleta, it's not only this representation who is from Antique, but the good uh, secretary is also from that province. So I am certain that he will uh, do something about bringing down the highest electricity rate in the island of Panay. And, uh, I would like to learn more about what uh, the good congressman had mentioned, and we can have a meeting after you are confirmed today uh, on how, what is the way forward to bring it down, because our poor Kasiman was, uh, good secretary, are uh, suffering the highest electricity rates in our island. Thank you. I'm sure I have your commitment. Thank you. Amanda. Thank you, secretary. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, yesterday also we uh, you, we mentioned the the possible assistance of the Philippine Competition Commission uh, to DOE, and maybe we can maximize that because, after all, one of the main objectives of EPIRA is to ensure the uh, security of reasonable rates of electricity under a fair and free regime of competition. So I, I believe you will need the assistance, the technical assistance of the Philippine uh, Competition Commission. Anyway, this is the domain. Uh, this is something that they should also uh, contribute to you uh, in order that we can rationalize the electricity rates, which is now becoming uncontrollable in so many areas, uh, as you might uh, already observe. Can, can, we, can we secure your commitment that uh, we can enlist the, uh, the assistance, the involvement of the Philippine uh, Competition Commission, Mr. Secretary? Definitely, Madam Chair, the, we'll involve the PCC. Yesterday also, uh, Mr. Secretary, we considered or you considered rather that the OSM was established in the EPIRA because it should be a mechanism, a market mechanism that will, uh, that will guide the direction of uh, the price of electricity because it will dictate, it will be based on the actual variation of the supply and demand. This is a very important market policy, but, uh, Unfortunately, as you will observe, Madam Chair, hindi talaga na-achieve yung purpose dahil kung if WSM is operating as efficiently as it has been projected to be, sana ay na-rationalize po yung electric rates, hindi po yung pataas na siya ng, ng pataas. Uh, talagang there, there is a problem and you, we, you probably need to revisit the guidelines uh in uh, in maintaining the spot market of electricity one way to to visit this uh mr secretary is the existence of uh i would say independent market operators the epira provided for an imo it's in the law but uh, initially there should be uh, a group, it's called AGMO, which in the beginning, it was fulfilled by 
the Philippine Electro Ele Electricity Market Corporation or the PEMC. Ultimately, the PEMC has to give it up to a legally constituted independent market operator. The problem today, Mr. Secretary, the IMAP has been questioned. I think again in this area, Madam Secretary, the ERC or the DOE slept on it for so long a time that the personality of the IMAP, it's called IEMOP, is not yet defined to the extent that it is now collecting market fees also without the approval of the ERC. If PMC is collecting market fees today, and IMAP is also collecting the market fees, so there are two animals collecting market fees, then it contributes to the rates of electricity, kaya po tumataas. This is something that we need to look into also, Mr. Secretary, because this is important. These are all important policies that will benefit our people ultimately because we need to bring down the rates of electricity, whether we like it or not, because this is the objective of the law. Kapag hindi po natin naibaba, talaga pong nakaka-prostrate na, Madam Secretary, the EPIRA law was enacted in 2021, uh, 2001. I'm sorry. Mabuti na lamang wala pa po ako noon, Mr. Secretary. Kasi pumasok po ako sa Congress 2004. EPIRA was enacted in 2001 or 21 years ago. The objectives are very simple. The obje objectives are very clear. I-maintain po natin yung affordable, fair, reasonable, and competitive price of electricity. Yun po yung batas. 21 years later, nandito pa po tayo, nagtatalo tayo, and now we ended up trying to elicit undertakings and commitments on policies that the DOE should enunciate and lay down it's not too late, Mr. Secretary, maybe in your time. Ngayon lang po natin ito magagawa. And I will congratulate you for doing that. You need to succeed, as I have said yesterday. Ito po ang pangako ni President Bongbong Marcos. Kasama po niya akong nangako, nakahihiya naman po kami kung hindi natin magagawa. In Congress, I have laid down several uh, bills already. I, we have 10 bills in Congress, all energy. Uh, palagay ko naman, tutulungan nyo kami dito. Naglatag, tayo, naglatag kami ng bills for solar energy. And maybe you, we can utilize the unused properties of the Philippine, uh, uh, the armed forces of the Philippines para lang po sa mga renewables natin, kag kagaya po na gusto nating mangyari. And Madam, uh, Madam Chair, no, you're also passionate about renewables because this is the only way we can address also another complex problem uh, that is uh, confronting our environment. There is no other way. The, the, the way forward is to go into renewables and free ourselves from fossil fuel, not only because it is dirty energy, Mr. Secretary, but because we should not be dependent much from the volatility of the market, the international market, ito lamang ang paraan, and this is the way to go forward. But there are structural problems also, why we cannot encourage developers renewable energy. Siguro po yung iba ay hindi ninyo alam. For example, a, uh, a developer, uh, mag, mag, magpapail po siya ng power project. So, he will apply a service contract with the DOE. Sa DOE pa lamang po, uh, bibigyan po siya ng letter of intent, and then uh, he will require to uh, present for uh, the mapping documents, but it will require months, Mr. Secretary. It discourages the EBOS law that the Senate passed several years ago. The EBOS uh, provides for an online application, but it is still dependent on your ITMS, your uh, uh, IT management services. It requires months. 
And the long queue is there. You, uh, maybe hindi nyo po uh, nakikita pa ito, but it is only a matter of being able to uh, siguro brief up your personnel. Siguro dagdagan nyo yung personnel and maybe mag-train sila sa i-train, i-retrain po natin. Try yung long queue will be discouraged. So the developer will not be discouraged from entering into this. And secondly, you have to also consider and, and to revisit yan pong requirement ng uh, SIS. This is the system impact study required by the NGCP. On the average, Madam, Sec Ma Madam uh, Chair, before the NGCP can issue the SIS, pasalamat na, tumatatapos siya in two years. How on earth can the poor developer even meet its uh, decommissioning commitment if the NGCP is supposed to be issued in two years' time? These are the problems that discourages, that discourage future developers and project uh, uh, yes, project developers in, into, into the energy. These are the fields, these are the issues that you need also to look into, Mr. Secretary. If you can undertake or commit that you look into this uh, as soon as possible, we will be very grateful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, definitely. In this, uh, the instances that you have enumerated, we commit. To and then uh, we have the problem of Malampaya. Uh, Senator Jingoy suggested this question to me yesterday. He said that do not forget to raise this question tomorrow because this is important. By the way, uh, Mr. Secretary, I need to uh, confide to you that even if, we, even if I withdrew a senatorial candidate, this, this promise was made to the voting public when we were having our campaign with the president. And Senator Jingo Estrada is seated beside me. He knows this. And then nung mag-withdraw ako, sabi ko sa kanya, bakit ka nag-withdraw kasi? Paano mong ipupursue itong uh, sinasabi mong promise na ito? Alam mo ka ako, Jingo, eh. mag-withdraw ako dahil sa ayokong maging, kasi sa survey, nakikita ko number two lang ako, ayokong number two. So pag nag-withdraw ako, siguradong number one si Robin, ikaw naman siguradong papasok ka dahil alam ko number 12 ka lang. <laughs> Yun ang dahil lang kaya ako nag-withdraw eh. But, kahit ako nag-withdraw, Mr. Secretary, talagang gusto kong mapursue ito because we really promised this to the voting public. Nakakahiya naman po kung hindi natin siseryosohin. Alam po ni Senator Jingo yun. Tingnan po ninyo yung malampaya, Mr. Secretary. I am worried. I think... uh, just an uh, intervention. I would like to thank Congressman Marcoletta for withdrawing. Uh, otherwise, he would have been number two. Thank you. Because you withdrew, I became number two, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Salamat po, Madam Chair. Malampaya... According to accounts, will be depleted by 2024. Tama po. The service contract will... Yeah, the service contract. But some say that it will probably go on up till 2027. What, what is your understanding about critical depletion? I think you are referring to the fact that it will be uh, depleted to the extent that it can no, the gas can no longer be extracted. Yes, because there is a continuous depletion and you can no longer expect the volume and the pressure that, you, that will come in from the gas field. It will also mean technically continuing durations from the supply of the four plants that fed by this natural gas. You are worried, Mr. Secretary. Of course, um, Mr. Congressman. You have reasons to get worried because there are five plants dependent on natural gas. And these five plants, Madam, Madam Chair, 
situate about 10 percent of our supply nationally. 30 percent in the Luzon grid. Am I correct? That's right. Man. So we have all the resources to worry because anytime this Malampaya gas field will come out without any warning, do we have any contingency? That's, that's why we have to act with uh, dispatch on the uh, on the, uh, the the first we have already acted with dispatch on the approval of the sale and now we are uh, con we are uh, addressing the extension of the service contract madam chair yes but uh, i i i observed that the notice to proceed were delayed by one year kasi merong then the notice to uh, construct meron yatang tatlo na ang dinombrahan ninyo but please I, I would advise the good secretary, Madam Chair, that if FGEN uh, is able to uh, construct an LNG terminal, which is the only alternative because Malampaya, whether you like it or not, will be depleted sooner than later, sana naman po uh, magkaroon tayo ng policy that FGEN, considering that it has the anchor market, because of the four plants operating using this natural gas, what's going monopolize? You know what I mean? Because if there is monopoly, again, the price of electricity will be affected. From the beginning up to the last interpolation or question that I will raise, it will revolve around the price of electricity because this is the promise that we made. Hindi po ako magdi-debate dyan, Mr. Secretary. Now, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, we, we got so many undertakings and commitment, structural reforms and policies uh, that the good Secretary has agreed to do. And in this way, I think he will not only be uh, drawing the line between himself and the other agencies under his own supervision. Not if not be probably in control, but this will effectively make him cross the line in the name of serving the greater majority of our, of our people. This is, I think, agreeable with us, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are committed to work with you and the Congress to pursue the objectives of the PRS you have underlined. Okay, so then it's upon Gagavinatin. We need to test your resolve. Tama naman po yun, Mr. Secretary. Di ba? Uh, alam naman po natin na uh, you are an independent uh, director of Aboytis. At hindi naman nyo kinakaila yun. And I believe you, you can, you can be more independent working for our people. You just said that you can make them unhappy. If that must be. Because you'll be serving a greater interest. Ngayon po, ang ERC is an appointee who came from Aboitis. Ang um, PISAM is now headed by an appointee coming from Aboitis. You came from Aboitis somehow or affiliated. In your in the course of your, uh, in the course of discharging your duties as secretary of the OE, you will be brushing shoulders with these people, uh, whom you are professionally affiliated and connected. You should have to allay the fears of our people, including myself, that you will always be working for the interest of our people, no matter what. Halimbawa, yung malampaya, abuitis might, might lang naman might want to influence uh, the timing of the sale of the remaining generating assets of NPC. But you should be there to arbitrate for the good of our people. Because you can influence even the timing, even the floor price of the bidding. ko nga yung NGCP, the reservation of the, of the grid, baka naman nagkaroon siya ng preference. Because 
you and the rest of your professional uh, colleagues came from them. But we will take your word for it, Mr. Secretary. That is the best way to erase the perception, the suspicion. And we would like you to succeed. Again, if you your success, your success is the benefit of our people. Diba, pare? Okay na. Isa na lang, sir. Isa na lang ito. This is now the test of the firm resolve of the secretary. Pag ito po nagawa na inyo, lahat po ng undertaking na binigay inyo, maniniwala na po kaming lahat. Yesterday, I had the chance of bringing about the corruptions in Beneco. Totoo na po ito. There are two audit reports already issued by the National Electrification Authority administration. An LGU, the smart city of an LGU in Benguet. Hindi ko na muna ang babanggitin po. Yung interconnectivity niya is dependent on this electric cooperative but they are not paying. <laughs> Meron pong interloper. Somebody assumed the position even though there is already a general manager who was endorsed, confirmed, and finally elected by DINEA members arbitration board. Hindi ko po maintindihan bakit po yung ating administrator is taking his sweet time to correct the anomaly. There cannot be two GMs at a time. Yung isa po kinocover up niya yung, uh, yung corruption doon. Because he actively campaigned for a defeated presidential candidate. We have pictures to prove that, Mr. Secretary. He should have been removed, possibly, if necessary. Can I get your undertaking that you remove that interloper and confirm the appointment of a legally and legitimately placed general manager in Beneco? I will give you until Friday, Mr. Secretary, if you can do that. That is a test of your resolve because... You are the chairman of the board of NEA, you understand? If the administrator cannot do it today, maybe you can order him that he do, he, he, he do this, he does it, not later than Friday. Can I get that commitment, Mr. Secretary? Uh, we, we can commit to, to do that, uh, Madam Chair, in accordance with the, with the law. Thank you. Yes, the law already tells you to do that. Mm. Corruption was already established yes. by these two audits. Mm -hmm. That interloper, that unauthorized general manager is now occupying the duty without any authority. Mm -hmm. Why can't Nea do something about it? The Commission on Appointments cannot remove that guy. But the DOE, through the Nea, can do it. So that is the law. He's an authorized, he's an interloper. The corruptions have been established. Bumili ng sasakyan, using, utilizing the, the omnibus credit with, the, with a certain bank. In my, in my uh, resolution uh, two, uh, two days ago or three days ago, I'm trying to subpoena the, even the bank's uh, documents to prove that the reason that the, uh, that the, the supplier was, was not paid last March, April, and May because the fund was utilized to campaign for that defeated candidate. These are all established, Mr. Secretary. So, this is the question of resolve on your part. So that, ako, bilang isa maniniwala, that talagang yung undertaking and commitment that you have just given to me, talagang magagampanan natin. So I give you until Friday, Mr. Secretary, to please correct the anomaly in Beneco. And the people in Benguet may, might be hearing our be hearing today. And you will be making them very, very happy. Can you, can you commit, Mr. Secretary? Um, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, as uh, 
also committed by the mayor administrator will address this this particular issue so are we committed that he will be removed on, on friday that's with law yes madam chair madam chair madam chair Madam Chair, I'm, I'm now finished with the commitment of the DOJ Secretary that Morning. in accordance with law, which I think it's all in his side, as promised, is going to remove the uh, I'm looking at you and I'm listening. Okay. The DOE secretary has just made a commitment that with the laws on his side is now committing to remove the other authorized general manager in Beneco, in Benguet, to remove him and it's, it's being given until Friday to do that, Madam Secretary. And I thank him for this firm resolve and if he does that on Friday, all the undertakings and commitment that he has given before us, I think will all be uh, accomplished. And we congratulate him for doing that, Madam Chair. Salamat po, Mr. Secretary. And you, you just make the Filipino, you just make the Filipino people, particularly the consumers of electricity, very, very happy. And they look forward to your help. And they will be watching you. Thank you very much. Salamat po, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Congressman Marcoleta. Uh, Secretary, any response, sir? Uh, definitely, Madam Chair. We, we want to commit with our uh, that department to work with you in, okay. and the Congress in realizing the goals and objectives of the IPRA and working at solutions for those that still need to be revisited. So the commitment... Uh, for the request in that specific cooperative is noted and action will be taken. And all the other issues that were raised in the past three hearings uh, are also noted and we will work together uh, with your team to be able to comply with those commitments, not for parochial interests, but for country. Thank you, sir. Um, there are other members of the commission who wish to propound questions. And I think it is a turn of Senator J.V. Ehepsito. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I'd just like to ask a few questions uh, because I think this is a clear and present danger that is uh, facing the, not only our country but the world. And I know that this uh, issue is very close to our chair and our, se our Senate President who are environment warriors. Um, the issue of global warming. We know for a fact that um, one, of the most, one of the biggest contributors that causes global warming is the greenhouse effect. And the big one of the biggest contributors of uh, the greenhouse effect is the, car, the emissions coming from uh, the coal plants. So I'd just like to know um, what your position is, because during the UN Climate Change Conference, our country was also committed, as along with other countries, that uh, we will reduce, gradually reduce our dependence on coal. Out of 130 countries, Madam Chair, the Philippines ranked 28th in the consumption of coal. We are still so much dependent on coal, while other countries are veering away already from its use. So, Mr. Secretary, un under your leadership, what is the policy and trust of government regarding the use of coal or the shift to other cleaner sources of energy? Because two things, we are contribute. Uh, we want we want to minimize uh, effect on global warming. Because po ngayon, you know, um, heat waves melting glaciers, droughts, flooding in uh, areas that don't flood, doon po sa mga areas na dapat umuulan, hindi na umuulan, sa mga areas na binab binabagyo, bumabagyo na po. So it's really a clear and present danger facing the world. So what is the direction of our dear Secretary uh, towards the shift or veering away from dependence on coal towards cleaner energy? Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, concern of yours, Mr. Senator, is something that uh, we share, and therefore we are committed to meet the targets of 35% of renewable energy by 2030. 
and 50% by 2040. Thank you. I know that uh, our Senate President and our um, Chair is also uh, an advocate of renewable energies. I also advocate renewable energies, but we know for a fact that renewable energy is um, uh, is that base load energy. No, it's intermittent. So for us to industrialize and for us to develop, you have a very important role to play, Mr. Secretary. Aside from infrastructure development, we have to have um, reliable source of energy and cheap cost of energy. So what do you think what would be partnered to renewable energy as our base load energy sources? Thank you, Madam Chair. So in, in uh, as a transition fuel, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Senator, natural gas is important and that's why we have placed a priority on the development of Malampaya and other sources. And in the meantime, we have to accommodate imported liquefied natural gas in order to make up for the decline. So this will help together with the energy storage systems like batteries to for us to utilize the uh, viable renewable energy. And likewise, uh, recently during the APEC, President Bobo Marcos met with the uh, French President uh, Emmanuel Macron and they discussed, um, they had a meeting and discussed the possibility of uh, partnerships with, um, on a, on a nuclear part, possible partnership on nuclear energy. So when the President speaks, I assume that will be already the policy of the administration. So what will be, do you, uh, what is the direction of the Department of Energy? Uh, Mr. Senator, definitely we agree with the, the instructions of the President are clear. Thank you. Of course, um, so you, it, it is being reconsidered, Mr. Secretary. Definitely, uh, Mr. Mr. Senator. But of course, just a reminder, of course, our priority is safety. That is uh, the concern of most of us. We are open because we need to find cheap sources of energy for us to be able to catch up with our ASEAN neighbors. So again, just a reminder, Madam Chair, before I wrap up, two, two things that are very important in our country for our economy to economy to be able to um, catch up with our neighbors, infrastructure and the low cost of energy, low but um, safe sources of energy. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Senator, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator JV, Secretary. On next in line, we have Senator Bongo. He's not yet here. Is ah, Senator online. Bongo's online? Okay, I'm sorry. I, Senator okay. Bongo, we recognize you, online, present. Madam Chair, uh, good morning. It's uh, just I no longer recognize the senators uh, who came in because I was told this is a continuing uh, session. Yeah. So um, just so that it's clear. Okay, yeah. Senator Go, please Madam proceed. Chair. Madam Chair, distinguished uh, colleagues and everyone in attendance, I would like to convey my sincere support for the ad interim appointment of Secretary Rafael Lotilia as Secretary of the Department of uh, Energy. Uh, having previously served as the Secretary of this, the same department, I have uh, no doubt as to the capability of Secretary Lotilia for this post, having been uh, lauded by many of his, uh, for his able uh, leadership during his uh, tenure in the DOE and for more and more for steering the country's energy landscape towards the right direction amid the many challenges he faced during his time ako po'y naniniwala muli na sa inyong uh, kakayahan na pamunuan ng gusto ang departamentong ito as you take this uh, new role again i appeal to you to look after the welfare of our countrymen lalong lalo po sa panahon ngayong nagtataasan ang presyo ng uh, langis uh, uh, hindi lang sa ating bansa, pati po sa buong mundo. At sa kakaikot ko talaga, daming reklamo po about uh, brownout. Uh, yun po, sana po yung matugunan nyo to uh, sa Palawan, sa Pagadian, sa iba't ibang parte ng uh, uh, bansa. Uh, tulungan po natin. Dahil talagang apektado rito yung mga, mga kababayan nating uh, uh, mahihirap na walang matakbuhan, mga helpless, mga hopeless. 
Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I also ask you to continue to build on the momentum of the previous administration. Sa katunayan nga po ay nung nakarang administrasyon, the government was able to secure enough supply of electricity para maiwasan nga po itong mga power interruption na ating nararanasan. The Duterte administration, through the efforts of our uh, fellow legislators in the 18th Congress, has also managed to extend to 30 years yung free uh, power subsidy for uh, poor uh, families and increase the rural electrification rate from 90.7 in 2016 to 94.5 in 2021. Sana po'y palakasin pa natin ang mga programa at uh, proyekto na makakatulong at makakapaganda pa po sa buhay ng bawat uh, Pilipino. We need to do whatever it takes to find the solutions for our uh, Filipino brothers and sisters, especially those who have blessed in life. Uh, Secretary La Lutilia, uh, full support po ako sa inyo. Uh, maraming salamat at mabuhay po kayo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. And we will definitely work with you on the achieving those goals. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bongo. Thank you, Secretary. We have um, Congressman Manuel Sagarbaria. Online. He is online. Congressman. I can see him online. Um, are you there? He's on mute. Uh, Congressman Sagarbaria. Yes. Okay, we proceed first to Congressman Ferge Biron, who is present here. And then can uh, the secretary please check Congressman Sagarbaria, who is online. We just could not see or hear him. Congressman Biron is recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. I just, wanna, I just wish to put on record my uh, support for the confirmation of the uh, ad interim appointment of our good secretary. Uh, apart from being an Ilongo and a Casimanoa, uh, this representation believes in the nominee's uh, integrity, competence, sense of fairness, and uh, character. But I just, uh, I just have uh, one very uh, uh, simple concern, uh, which I raised during our informal meetings, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, this concerns the guidelines no? and the eligibility or qualifications for candidates running for board of directors no? of uh, electric cooperatives. As our uh, majority leader had uh, emphasized uh, and articulated yesterday, the qualifications and eligibility are unreasonably restrictive. It is easier to run for president of this country than to run as a board of director of uh, electric cooperatives. I just wish to uh, uh, secure your commitment that NEA, the NEA board, uh, will review the guidelines and uh, make it more reasonable and practical because as I observe it in our own district, uh, uh, the most qualified candidates uh, become disqualified. So I just wish to get that commitment from the Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wish to uh, give my full support and give my commitment to revisit those guidelines. And we will work on that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Biron. Congressman Sagarbaria will no longer propound questions. Senator Chis Escudero has a reservation, but is not uh, present today. So maybe just one call in case Senator Escudero is online. Can someone from the Secretariat call his office if he's not present in the building? Online. He's not online. Is he, on, in okay. the building? is he in the building? Is he in the building? This is just to give everyone a chance who have reserved in the past weeks to propound questions. And we thank the good secretary for his patience and for answering all the concerns of the members of the commission. We also, at this point, would wish to acknowledge the officers, women and men of the Department of Energy. Uh, welcome to the Senate. I can see uh, all the new faces as well. Okay, so uh, we don't have Senator Escudero. Any other inquiries for 
from members or representatives or senators? If there is none, Madam Chair, yes. may I make the motion Very good. and support the majority floor leader that we move to approve on committee level and send to plenary the interim appointment for confirmation of Secretary Paul Pomerini. Very good. Um, there is a motion to recommend. Uh, but before we, the motion to recommend to the plenary, we will just uh, state that clearly there are no inquiries or clarifications from or for the appointee at this point. And um, there is a motion, no less, from the Senate President uh, to recommend to the plenary for the Commission to confirm the ad interim appointment of Secretary Rafael Perpetua, Perpetuo M. Tilia as Secretary, Department of Energy. Again, for the record, he is from Sibalom, Antique. He is my Simanwa. And I am happy, Mr. Secretary, to have shepherded your confirmation uh, with the difficult task and challenges of the energy sector, bringing down the prices of electricity rates, which is the key towards a sustainable pandemic recovery. Uh, we thank you for accepting the post in this most challenging time. We also thank our members of the Commission, our congressmen and senators, for all the very helpful queries, inquiries, uh, questions. And we thank especially Congressman Dante Marcoleta, who agreed to come in this morning, who agreed to defer his commitments in his radio program, and previously requested that the hearings be scheduled next year. But I can say this in open hearing, but uh, the Senate President and I earnestly spoke to Congressman Marcoleta and, of course, the Majority Leader and the Chair of the House panel, uh, realizing the importance and urgency of the task at hand, that you must be able to do your job well, efficiently, effectively, without uh, undue favors, in a fair manner, as we know you will, because this is a very important sector, and this involves the Filipino people. So having said that, um, there are no objections to the uh, motion of the Senate President to send to the plenary the uh, confirmation, the ad interim appointment, Secretary Lutilia. The, th here, the chair here is none. The motion is hereby approved. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, there being no other matters to discuss, I move to adjourn the meeting. The meeting is hereby adjourned.
first meeting of the Committee on Science and Technology of the Commission on Appointment and the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. Please call the roll. The Honorable Officers and Members of the Committee on Science and Technology. Member Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay. Representative Ferginel G. Biron, MD. Senator Francis G. G. Escudero. Senator Jingoy Ejercito Estrada. Representative Albert S. Garcia. Representative Greg G. Gasataya. Senator Christopher Bongo. Present, ma'am. Present. Senator Lisa Ontiveros. Senator Loren Legarda. Senator I. E. Marcos. Senator Grace Po. Representative Lani Mercado Revilla. Representative Jordine Jesus M. Romualdo. Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria. Senator Francis Tol N. Tolentino. Senator Cincha A. Villar. Our ex officio members, Vice Chairperson, Representative Ramon N. Guico Jr. Sure. Majority Floor Leader, Representative Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villafuerte Jr. Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Senator Joseph Victor G. Ejercito. Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Representative Rodante D. Marcoleta. Minority Floor Leader, Senator Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano. Assistant Minority Floor Leader, Representative Jose Gay G. Padjernos. Uh -huh. Assistant Minority Floor Leader, Representative Johnny uh -huh. T. Pimentel. The committee chairperson is present. Secretary President. With eight members present in person, including the chair, and 10 members present, and two members present and online with a total of 10. Members present, the existence of a quorum is hereby declared. The chair acknowledges the presence. Good morning, esteemed members of the Commission on Appointment, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today, your committee will deliberate on the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato O'Malley Solidum Jr. as Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. Secretary Villarica kindly report on the jurisdictional requirements and other pertinent information relative to the ad interim appointment of Secretary Solidum. Junior in compliance with the new rules of the Commission and the new rules of the Standing Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. The current ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Umali Solidum Jr., dated September 29, 2022, was received by the Commission Secretariat on October 6, 2022, and was referred to the Committee on Science and Technology on October 10, 2022, by the Senate President and CA Chairperson Juan Miguel Migs F. Zubiri. His ad interim appointment was likewise published in two newspapers of general circulation, the Manila Times and Manila Standard, on August 12, 2022, and broadcast over PTB4 on August 11, 2022, at 6.36 p.m. The appointee had completed the, completed the submission of the mandatory documentary requirements on September 27, 2022, as provided in Section 24, Chapter 6 of the New Rules of the Commission. Lastly, the Commission Secretary has not received any opposition against his interim appointment. That is all, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. The President of the President would like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Grace Paul. Okay, uh, Secretary Villarica kindly administer the oath of the appointee. Secretary Solidum, please stand and raise your right hand. 
Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you, God. Mr. Chairman, the appointee is now under oath. Um, uh, the floor is now open for, for any inquiries. If there is any. Opening statement. I don't know if any statement. Ah, so, uh, Mr. Solidum, you now you may now give your uh, opening statement if you have any. Um, Mr. Chair, um, your honors, uh, thank you. I'm here to submit to your proceedings for my confirmation as ad interim secretary of DOST. I've been with the DOST since. Uh, uh, 1984, after graduating from UP, and I've served the government since then in various capacities, and Director of EVOX from 2003 to 2017, Under Secretary from 2017 up to uh, 2022, and now as the Ad Interim Secretary. And together with uh, my colleagues from the department, we will push for the socioeconomic agenda of the President, so that the uh, um, mission of DOST to provide maximum economic and social benefit for the Filipinos will be realized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Secretary Solido. The floor is now open for any inquiries, if there is any. And uh, recognize the Majority Leader, El Rey Villapuerte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I fully support your confirmation, uh, just to reiterate. I just have a few questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, I noticed that under your educational background, you graduated Bachelor of Science in Geology in UP. You had the Master of Science in Ge Geological Science in University of Illinois and Doctor of Philosophy in Earth Sciences. I'm just curious. Uh, so you are a licensed uh, geology spot, sir? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman, yes, I am a licensed geologist. So you're a licensed geologist and uh, your background basically is geological sciences or geology. Uh, I think you're more fit to be DNR secretary than the OST. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman, being an earth scientist covers uh, many fields of science. As a practice so we're in the university where I went at the University of California, San Diego, we have to know many different sciences so that we can work together uh, with many other scientists to really provide uh, solutions to problems. So that's the background that I took from the U.S. So when I went to the uh, back, went back to FIVOX, I uh, dealt with many agencies to promote not only disaster risk reduction, but most importantly, focus at the DOST level, uh, the organization development where we can maximize all our efforts uh, from all across the different agencies of DOST. Uh, to support many of the sectors uh, that will that would really propel our uh, economy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Don't you think, Mr. Secretary, just uh, uh, no, uh, hypothetical question, don't you think that an engineer should be more fit to head the DOST? Um, any scientist can uh, head the Department of Science and Technology as long as... Uh, they have a complete background of what the department should be focused on, and they can lead many other scientists uh, in ensuring that what needs to be done uh, operationally can be done, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I agree with you because uh, sometimes the courses do not really match your career, and you've been in government for 38 years, and most of that is under the DOST, no? But I was also reading your profile that uh, in, you really wanted to be an engineer more than a geologist. Is that correct? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to be a civil engineer, but I ended up as a geologist. And uh, although my intention was to transfer to the civil engineering department, I decided to go for nurse science uh, profession, Mr. Chair. I was also reading your profile that your passion or leisure time is gardening and landscaping. So the more reason I'm convinced that you should be in the DNR, <laughs> FDA, no, uh, uh, 
No, no. This is in relation to your competence and fitness. And uh, I know you're very highly qualified. I, I did, I'm reading your resume and I wish I have the same background and experience as you. However, <laughs> just, to, ano, no, just to know the character of the person, uh, my colleagues might laugh again, but this is in relation to your <laughs> fitness. Your hobby is watching Netflix. So, no, but yes, uh, my wife likes Korean, so you can see why why she likes to go to Korea. But my question is, what are your favorite movies in Netflix? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm into, uh, like, uh, um, investig investigatory uh, series, uh, especially on... Uh, um, on many aspects of security. So, that, like, uh, I'm, I've been watching uh, Blacklist. Uh, so, dapat po sa ano kayo, PNP Cyber Lab or something? <laughs> no, no, because, ano, listen to me, you know, my point is, kung, if you really love science and technology, you should be watching documentaries about how Japan prospered because of science and technology, how China has prospered, uh, as in science, no, because uh, here, chair, if I may interject, I think many of us, although we like our jobs, when we go home, we like to watch something that's a little bit different from what we do. See, Greece, no money. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, no, no, sir. Uh, no, no, because my segue, you know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people say that infrastructure or uh, uh, ha a faster speed of uh, bandwidth can propel a country. I agree with that. But I firmly believe, uh, Mr. Secretary, that your, your department is the most underrated department. But in fact, if we want this country to prosper, we should all focus on science and technology, uh, Mr. Secretary. The U.S. and the first world countries prospered because of science and technology, uh, engineering, scientists, uh, unfortunately, our country, you know, most of the graduates want to be nurses so they can work abroad. My, my, my ultimate uh, desire is for you, sir, is to humanize and make the, the USD more relevant to the times. Uh, as you understand, even in the budget hearings in Congress, uh, ang palagi talagang uh, Maraming tanong are, you know, Department of Agriculture, uh, Public Works. But, you know, uh, when it comes to DOST, uh, parang there's a lack of interest. Uh, so what I'm saying is, sana you can make the DOST more palatable, more exciting for the people. So my question, sir, is uh, what are the top five things bad that, you know, that you will do as a priority when our beloved president asks you to be the secretary of the USD, what came in your mind that you wanted to accomplish the top five things you wanted to do in the six years uh, given to you as the US secretary, knowing that you've been in the DOST for so long, you've seen how it works, you've worked with other secretaries, you've known what they lacked uh, in doing now that you're in, at the helm of the DOST, what do you want to do? Maybe you can cite five major things that you want to accomplish so we can know and uh, hopefully support you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman. Um, we will support the socioeconomic agenda of the, of the government, of the current administration, and uh, we actually lined up 11 major programs, but uh, to look at the top five. First is to create uh, science, technology, and innovation enterprises and jobs, where we actually need to push for R&D and our efforts at the local level to um, transfer the technologies that we develop to the local government or commercialize it for the benefit of our people. Second and very important is we would need to look at food security because this is really a very challenging times for us uh, because of many uh, tensions abroad and, of course, the need for uh, being food secure, especially with global warming. Third would be on health. 
As we focus on the current COVID-19 pandemic, we need to anticipate future pandemic as a global warming as we encroach our biodiversity area. We are actually encroaching into uh, uh, the environment of uh, our uh, uh, wild animals. And uh, since the Philippines is a biodiverse country, and knowing the fact that one of the suspect uh, source of COVID is the bat, we are very diverse and we are encroaching into it. So we need to really prepare our country for future pandemics of health. Of course, we need to look at uh, water and environment, and of course, uh, energy and transport. This would be supported, of course, by other existing programs of DOST, such as human capital, digital transformation, and developing smart and sustainable communities at the uh, local level. Uh, tatlo lang po yun, ha? Lima yung... Anyway, I was asking for five things. But my question is, what is the core competence of the Filipino? We're, we have so many inventors that really lack funding. My question is, if you want Congress to fund uh, a program that the Filipino can excel, an invention of a Filipino, what would it be? I think the uh, Philippine Startup Grant uh, Act is very uh, important, and this uh, enables many of the budding uh, scientists, technologists, and inventors to really promote and try to do R&D for their invention. And we've seen that many other countries have really uh, developed through this. Uh, similarly, uh, there are many other relative uh, uh, relatives of this kind of startup. Uh, technology business incubation hubs would be critical. So what we lack, and uh, we have noticed this, is the entrepreneurship uh, aspect or side of many of our scientists and engineers. So uh, given that kind of focus, we also need to assist them in uh, transferring their technologies by making them partner with potential investors and also um, have them uh, prepare for uh, developing uh, their inventor inventions into a spin-off company for commercialization. Yes, I was a principal author of the Startup Law and the Innovation Act. It's already a law. No? Thank you for mentioning that. It's not being uh, utilized well. But my question is, uh, in terms of like an area, you mentioned uh, IT. That's good. We have a lot of IT graduates. No, In fact, uh, the country should uh, emulate other countries. No in putting up an ICE academies, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship, which we're putting up in our province. But what I'm saying is, what uh, ano, ano ba, ano ba uh, in terms of agriculture? Ba? Uh, is it true that the fluorescent lamp was invented by a Filipino called Flores? That's the, Mr. Chair, that's the... Uh, statement that uh, is being uh, But mentioned. is it true that, that the fluorescent lamp was initially invented by a Filipino called, uh, with the family name Claude Flores, but eventually was not patented or something that... Uh, is it true? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if it's true. <laughs> and and uh, I heard that the, the karaoke was invented by a Filipino. That was also mentioned uh, that it was indeed, but for sure... Um, the video, the video phone was invented by a Filipino way back in the 1950s. And uh, Mr. Dado Banatao invented uh, an, an IT uh, hardware. Is that true? Chip? Yes, Mr. Chair. So what I'm Chip. saying is, uh, we already have. What I'm saying, sir, is uh, the country will prosper if we have uh, we support uh, inventors. Uh, I think Filipino are creative enough. They just need funding. Is it correct? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, we need to support them uh, with funding and also with uh, business modeling so that they can really prosper, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's public knowledge that uh, the IRI uh, was established during the time of uh, President Marcos and we only taught the Chinese and the Thais to plant rice. Now we are importing rice from them. Is that correct? Yes, so we are importing a lot of rice, but we have technologies, Mr. Chair that can also propel the agricultural sector as developed by our uh, scientific community. What I'm saying, uh, Mr. Secretary, is there are already technologies available in our country which other countries uh, benefited from uh, and we did not. So uh, I hope uh, under your leadership, sir, that we continue to innovate, we continue to create, 
uh, and uh, fully utilize this to you know propel our country for inventions and growth. And uh, DOST, I think, uh, as you know, yun po ang paboritong department ng aking ama, and you were mentioning earlier, uh, it's not sexy to say DOST, but uh, I think uh, DOST should be given more budget. Uh, we should empower more DOST under leadership. Anyway, uh, marami salamat, and uh, we wish you all the luck. Uh, we fully support you, and uh, salamat po, Mr. Chair. Chairman, uh, Chairman Malapitan. Can I make a comment? Can I manifest? I'll just make a manifestation. I just want to make a manifestation with regards to the topic of uh, Majority Floor Leader El Rey Villafuerte with regards to ERI. ERI is not really uh, a Philippine-supported uh, organization. It is an international organization based in the Philippines. And actually, ERI is being financed by foreign. And the biggest benefactor of ERI is Bill Gates. And the instruction of Bill Gates is to support Africa. <laughs> so we cannot expect a lot from ERI because it depends on who are financing the project of ERI. Our uh, rice, uh, our, our rice agency, which are being supported by the Philippines, is the Phil Rice for seeds and the Phil Mech for mechanization. Just for the information of everybody. And I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Secretary Solidum because I think uh, the OST is not only for technology on, on IT and so forth, because I had a meeting with him and he sent me this uh, uh, enhancing agricultural productivity and he sent me uh, uh, reading materials for the productivity of crops, fishing, livestock, poultry, and dairy. So I guess the OST also is for agriculture. So it's for everybody with regards to technology. Thank you very much. It's the presence of uh, Representative J.J. Romualdo. So, I will now recognize uh, Representative Lani Mercado Rebilla. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, uh, I do believe that you are really made for the task uh, of uh, being our DOST Secretary since you've worked so hard for the past 38 years in uh, several posts and particularly at uh, the DOST. Um, gusto ko lang pong itanong, kamusta na po ba ang Balik Scientist Program ng DOST? Dahil alam ko po marami na po ang uh, nangingibang bansa at uh, doon na po nagtatrabaho dahil uh, mas lucrative ang sweldo po sa ibang bansa. How is it uh, being implemented now, uh, Mr. Secretary? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh... Madam Congresswoman, um, the Balik Scientist Program, after its uh, institutionalization with the Balik Scientist Act, has really uh, uh, progressed very well, where many of our uh, scientists would want to come. And so far in the past three years, we had around 140 plus scientists, and some of them uh, had decided to stay in the Philippines because uh, they are provided with the opportunity to do research, but also uh, patriotic and help our uh, Kababayans. And I'm very glad that uh, several of this uh, were very useful in the current crisis. For example, in the African, African swine fever, uh, one has developed a mobile laboratory uh, in Mindanao now so that they can have uh, in place uh, diagnost diag diagnostics of uh, the potential ASF. Uh, the other one is in Iloilo looking at marine sediments for uh, prospective uh, biomedical applications. 
That's good to hear, uh, Mr. Secretary. Nabanggit po kanina ng ating majority floor leader yung tungkol po sa technology at nabanggit din po ni Senator Cynthia yung tungkol po sa kaalaman na tinutulong po ng DOST sa agrikultura. Um, any prospects or any projects that that's ongoing right now in a partnership with DOST and the DA with uh, regards to vertical farming since uh, at naniniwala po tayo na ito po ang uh, magsusulong ng programa ng ating mahal na Pangulo, BBM? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Congresswoman, we have partnership with DA on vertical farming. Uh, one uh, university that is looking into that is the Central Zone State University. Uh, and indeed, uh, even urban farming can be very important for, for us in the urban area. So um, this collaboration needs to be continued and uh, other technologists can actually uh, um, improve the uh, production of many commodities uh, in partnership with DA, not only from uh, planting, but also, for example, from for post-harvest uh, technologies and uh, value chain addition. Uh, Madam Congresswoman. Salamat po. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, naniniwala po ako na ang kabataan ng pag-asa ng ating bayan. And we really have to encourage more of our students to be involved in science and technology. Ano pong tulong ang naibibigay po natin sa ating pong mga kabataan to encourage them to, uh, um, to uh, study or focus more on science and technology para sa advancement po natin sa larangang ito? Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Congresswoman, uh, the DOST through, uh, through organizations uh, are helping uh, our youth to really pursue STEM courses. One is through the Philippine Science High School System, where we have uh, for this year around uh, close to 10,000 scholars all over the country. And for undergraduates, masters, and PhD, the Science Education Institute is providing scholarships. Now, as aside from that, we have developed uh, uh, instructional materials, both print and uh, online, where we share this with DepEd. And uh, also we provide the, uh, teachers for training for DepEd teachers to imp for them to improve on their skills to really teach our youth on, uh, on STEM. Okay. Marami pong salamat, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I would like to manifest my full support to your confirmation, Secretary Solidum. Maraming salamat po, Mr. Chair. Before we proceed, we would like to acknowledge the arrival of Representative Albert Garcia. Representative Dante Marcoleta is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, do you know the Hadron Collider in G Collider? in Geneva, Switzerland. Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Mr. Congressman. I, I was uh, reading an article. It was built by European organization. It's a nuclear research facility where about 10,000 scientists are working on certain particles. And among their objectives, I was informed is to even look at the very source of human life. I am asking you this because that is probably the most modern, the most sophisticated research laboratory, science laboratory. Ang gusto ko lamang pong may tanong sa inyo, ganong pa po tayo kalayo doon, Mr. Secretary? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman, um, we are not into the uh, science as basic as the uh, collider uh, topics. Okay. What we are focused now is to use the innovation for economic applications. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and industrial, uh, industrial revolution 4.0 uh, is being used for advanced manufacturing. We have the first, uh, one of the first ASEAN-led uh, government center for advanced manufacturing, for additive uh, uh, manufacturing, into 3D printing, where we actually partner with various industries. So you're saying that we are into um, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and so on and so forth. 
Let's go back to Netflix. Have you viewed uh, the designated survivor? Uh, partly, but I did not finish because at the time yes, I it's I'm a so long good. series. Yes, sir. What about the manifest? Not yet, sir. Uh, the good doctor. Not yet. Uh, extraordinary attorney who? Yeah, sometimes with my wife, Mr. Chair. Press landing on you, I did, Mr. Chair. Last question, Paul. Last question. Uh, ano po ba yung kinakain ng mga astronauts sent to the orbit? Yung mga ano sila, vitamins and compacted food. Kasi po kaya ako tinatalang yun, uh, they are in orbit, they spend uh, days, even months without cooking their food kasi po wala, hindi naman sila pwedeng magluto doon sa kanilang spaceship. Tama po ba? Yes, Mr. Chair. I am thinking aloud na kung sakali pong makaimbento tayo nung kinakain nila, ibibigay ko po sa mga mahihirap na kababayan natin. Even for months, hindi sila kakain, sila mamamatay. Meron po ba tayong gano'n? Makakagawa po ba tayo ng gano'n? Uh, Mr. Chair, what we have right now is uh, meals ready to eat for uh, uh, disaster victims that has a shelf life of uh, six months. And hindi na po lulutuin. But uh, we don't have that kind Ito, of... Uh, ang ito ko sabi, yung minsan niya lang kakainin, naabot po na six months? I don't think we have that, Ayun Mr. Chair. Ayun po yung aking tinatanong kasi po yung astronauts. Pag kinain niya yun, it will last for several days, if not months. Yun po yung... Kasi yung pong mahirap na mahirap talaga, wala po siya talagang makakain eh. Ito po palliative lang. I I meaning to say, we have to just uh, fill up a gap. Kung sakali pong matulungan natin, the poorest of our poor, hindi na, imbe na invento po ninyo yung uh, uh, pilduras or whatever. Kahit anong kulay pa po yun, tatanggapin ko. Pag ininom po ng mahirap, yung two weeks lang, Mr. Secretary, na hindi siya bumili ng pagkain, hindi siya nagluto, ang laking bagay na po yun. Yun yung pointin natin, makakagawa kaya tayo ng ganun? We have to look into that, Mr. Chair, uh, because we are into uh, nutrition and food security, so we'll ask our scientists uh, what their long-term program is, but definitely food security and nutrition, availability of nutritious food uh, is really a concern of the OST, Mr. Chair. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Salamat po, Mr. Secretary. Sana ka makaimbento po tayo talaga na kailangan-kailangan po natin. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Congressman Magoleta. The next will be uh, Representative Greg Gazataya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Magandang umaga. Uh, Mr. Secretary, two weeks ago, uh, in the Committee on Energy in the House, uh, we conducted a hearing on a bill which I filed. We're in, we will provide the incentives with the development of uh, renewable energy storage facilities. One of the issues raised during the hearing is the lack of research uh, for the development of uh, said uh, facilities. So may we get the commitment on the chair of the good secretary uh, conduct a research as well as uh, help the Department of Energy as well as the ERC uh, in pushing for uh, this uh, study or research, uh, Honorable Chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman, yes, uh, we have actually a uh, going research on uh, uh, storage uh, facility. Uh, we actually have designated several uh, higher education institutions to look into that uh, so that we can have the uh, advanced batteries for storage of whatever energy we can store. And the Industrial Technology and Development Institute, together with the DOE, has uh, developed a testing uh, and uh, research center also for batteries, Mr. Chair. So along that line, Honorable Chair, may we ask the good secretary to please uh, provide uh, uh, an update or uh, information to the Committee on Energy so that uh, it will guide us accordingly in the approval of the said uh, bill, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman, yes, we will. Yeah, and lastly, Honorable Chair, may I manifest my support to the appointment of the good secretary, Honorable Chair. Thank you. 
Okay, um, Mr. Chairman. Representative Veron is recognized. Uh, please uh, include me in the line of questioning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, magandang umaga, Secretary. Yes. Uh, as we all, as we're all aware, Mr. Secretary, that in any industry, the uh, research and development is vital, and uh, it's it's crucial in uh, in the development of uh, and discovery of uh, of of many things. Uh, by any chance, Mr. Secretary, uh, are you aware of any um, drug discovered in the Philippines or from the Philippines? Well, the uh, the uh, herbal medicines are being used now. For example, the Lagundi. So this is really applicable now, and we are into many other Tuklas Lunas or drug discovery program. One of which is the uh, uh, marine sediments for medicine. I know that the uh, snail was actually used to get some. Uh, uh, medical application out of it. Uh, I agree with you, uh, uh, Secretary, that uh, in the recent past, uh, many herbal uh, uh, products have been found to have therapeutic value, and in fact, they are considered as medicines already. Uh, I just wish to uh, uh, inform the Secretary that uh, in 1949, uh, Dr. Abilardo Aguilar, who is a doctor from my place, from Iloilo, actually discovered the molecule, you know, that led to uh, the commercialization of uh, erythromycin. Marketed, it was patented by Eli Lilly. And at the time, Dr. Aguilar was actually a drug representative of that multinational company based in the US. So, na discover yon sa backyard niya, no? Yung uh, bacteria. And from that bacteria, Streptomyces uh, erythraeus, original uh, species, was isolated and sent to the it was sent to the US isolated and they actually synthesized the uh, the product, no? And uh, that gave rise to erythromycin. The discovery is such is so revolutionary, especially that it was an alternative drug for patients who are allergic to penicillins. It's a macrolide, and in fact, until today, since the commercialization of erythromycin in 1952, hanggang ngayon po ilang taon na yon, uh, 48 plus 22, so that's already 70 years of application. Unfortunately, Eli Lilly never compensated, not even a single centavo. So, with this, considering the constant threat of, uh, of, of COVID, and I'm sure this is not the last pandemic in our lifetime, uh, may I know from the good secretary, what are your plans as far as like vaccine development and, and other, you know, things that uh, should protect us or should uh, give us some hope that in anticipation of any problem of this sort, like another pandemic, would give the Philippines a better chance of acquiring our own vaccines? Ang Thailand nakadevelop ng sarili nilang vaccine eh. And many other countries, Cuba developed their own vaccine. That's why walang walang po mapasok na multinational company don sa Cuba because the Cubans develop and they're one of the best discoverers and uh, the best scientists in the world that develop biological products. So kanina I was listening to uh, your response uh, with respect to the mandate no, of the DOST. So don sa health. Walang, walang mention of any of any effort or any investment towards vaccine development or any biological project. So may I know from the secretary if this is one of those being considered? Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman, yes. Uh, we've uh, pushed for the creation of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, which passed the third reading of uh, of the House of Representatives that is intended to coordinate the study of viruses on humans, animals, and plants, one health, and to make sure that we have a complete phase of vaccine development. But this will be in coordination with many other departments and research institutions under the Department of Health and other uh, uh, partner institutions, higher education institutions. And that's really the plan, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, Mr. Chair, for us to really be prepared for the next pandemic, especially because uh, we think that this is not the last pandemic and we have to prepare for the next one, especially so, as I mentioned earlier, with the biodiversity encroachment of the population uh, and the Philippines is a biodiverse country, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Se Mr. Secretary. There's no better time no, uh, but today to go into this uh, kind of uh, of incentive you know for government really to uh, to uh, put money into this kind of project you know setting up a virology uh, center uh, is not actually enough as you know uh, vaccine development is very complex when we were confronted with covid-19 uh, everybody was you know, was crazy. And, you know, uh, despite the uh, established long-term safety of the uh, of the vaccines that were developed, in fact, until today, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a knowledge given to, uh, to us by our experts that these products that have been commercialized actually didn't have any registration at all from any regulatory uh, agency, from any country. You know, the vaccine that's all injected to all of us today here, you know, we're never registered. They're all under permission given is only under emergency use authorization. In other words, Mr. Secretary, in the established and long-term safety nito, so we're all guinea pigs actually, you know, but you know, this representation did not have any uh, any vaccination except for the natural vaccine. Now, I do not want to promote the name, the brand, but because simply because, as a as a as a as a, as a, as a physician myself, I'm not convinced on the long term safety of other uh, vaccines uh, developed under various platforms. So, dapat pag-isipan talaga natin dito. No, uh, mRNA is you know is very popular, but uh, US FDA has in fact uh, uh, put in the label of all mRNA that patients ages eighteen to thirty nine should be uh, careful because these mRNA vaccines could result into severe myocarditis and or pericarditis and many. The most, the number of adverse events really happen uh, using mRNA. So we should be more, you know, uh, uh, forward looking. It's not only a question of developing, uh, you know, a center for identification of various uh, of vi viruses, but more importantly, really to develop what kind of platform do we really want so that our, our, our citizens would be safe. So I, I just want to, you know, uh, from Congress, uh, Mr. Secretary, we want to work closely with you and uh, tap even the, uh, the talents of uh, a number of medical practitioners in Congress uh, so that we can help your, your department. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman. We will partner with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Congressman Romualdo is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, honorable members, and good morning, uh, Secretary uh, Solidong. Good morning, sir. Um, out of curiosity, uh, Mr. Chairman, your honors, and uh, to the Secretary, marami na mong vulkan na pong volcanic eruptions but uh, the same way with the uh, 
Congressman Marco Leta was asking for those astronauts going in orbit. Out of curiosity, uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor, ang gusto ko palang tanungin, yung material ho, na ginagamit ng rocket that can withhold the heat no? in going to the moon or sun yung exploration na yun. Yung material na yun, di ba gawin natin yun na uh, sa mga bulkan na instead na bubutasan yung bulkan, lalabas yung lava para hindi na pumutok yung bulkan. Mayroon po kayang aral na, na kasi I am so curious sa uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor, kasi imagine hindi natutunaw yun eh. Tapos babalik. Although it's number of days, sabihin mo na lang months, or hot, kayang-kaya pumunta ng rocket doon, tapos babalik. E kung di kaya natin subukan yan na sa vulkan, bubutasan, lalabas yung laba, para hindi na puputok yung vulkan. I'm just curious, uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor. Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman, a volcano would erupt if there is too much pressure uh, and the high temperature. So even if one would uh, with the volcano, it may or may not be an erupt. It may or may actually achieve an eruption and not stop it. Because the energy below the volcano, the magma, is much more enormous than the, the whatever trigger we want to do. Um, to make sure that uh, lava would come out and flow to another part, we cannot control it. In fact, it might actually cause... Uh, the uh, volcano to explode as we lessen the pressure. So if we lessen the pressure of the volcano on top, it may trigger the sudden rise of magma and it, magma and it will explode. That's why nobody has tried to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Your Honor. Okay, is it just one? Is it Maybe we represent the people Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, it is of no doubt that technology and education are some of the key factors to improving our future. Lalo na ngayon na madaming nakadepende po sa teknolohiya. May we know from the nominee what are the some of the current programs that are being implemented to, part, to further improve the so, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman, um, the your team through the Philippine Science High School and Science Education Institute provides scholarship to our youth who are interested in STEM. We're also providing uh, training for teachers and also making sure that uh, um, to further advance the interest of our students, we are um, uh, holding a competition on robotics, on artificial intelligence, on use of internet, and hopefully by next year, as uh, also suggested by good Senator Tolentino, we will have a National Youth Summit uh, Science and Technology Festival so that we will have competitions in all over the region and have like a, an Olympic style of competition at the national level so that we can have more interest from the youth. Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman. Mr. Chair, uh, this is not a question. This is a manifestation of uh, support to the Secretary. Uh, you got my uh, support, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Secretary Solidum. Mabilis lang po, Mr. Chair. Uh, Secretary, yesterday, uh, nag-deliberate po yung COE sa iba't ibang mga departamento, including uh, the Department of uh, the WICT. And I mentioned that uh, in Bataan, we are uh, hosting the blockchain technology 
which can be a solution to many of our social problems. For example, yung remittance ng ating mga OFW, pwedeng malaki yung ibaba sa mga fees uh, sa pamamagitan ng blockchain. Aside from, ngayon, ginagawa po natin yung national ID na pwede rin makatuloy yung blockchain for data portability and uh, appropriate identification of the ID bearer. So, Bataan is one of the leading uh, provinces and we wanted to partner with the DICT. In, case of, uh, in the case of uh, DOST, as you know, Mr. Secretary, uh, maganda rin po ang initiative ng ating Bataan Peninsula State University with regards to 3D printing. That can also be a solution to many of our social problems. For example, the target of uh, our administration, ang administration ng ating Pangulo, is to build 6 million housing units the next six years. So if you will do it in the traditional way, mas matagal, mas costly, and uh, we face many other challenges. But with, with the evolution of 3D printing, we will not in manufacture as opposed to constructing these uh, millions of housing uh, units. So, gusto ko lang pong uh, uh, ipresenta sa inyo ang ating magaling na State University and in this program headed by Professor Coco Dison na sana makapag-partner tayo and let's find solutions with this technology to some of our problems, more particularly in our housing challenge for the country. Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman, thank you very much for that uh, statement on the Bataan uh, <laughs> State University. Uh, you referring to the AMREL or the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Research Laboratory, yes, uh, which the OST has funded to be supported. And our Advanced Manufacturing Center of the DOST will support the AMREL. In fact, uh, the next phase of our 3D printing uh, priority, uh, since we have printed polymer, ceramic, and metals, is to print concrete so that we can help in the uh, construction of uh, uh, resistant houses in the Philippines, either by whole or by piece, because this will really revolutionize the housing industry and making sure that they're resistant to typhoon and earthquake. Of course, I'm very glad that uh, we have the AMREL in the in Bataan, Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman. I am glad to hear that, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Chair. That is all for this representation. And uh, the good secretary has the support of the second district of Bataan. Maraming salamat po. Well, before we proceed, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Alan Peter Caetano. Mr. Uh, Floor Leader. Si ano yata, will, uh, Congressman Johnny will say uh, a few words. Uh, few words. Just a short, not among very few. Okay, Congressman. Uh, uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, because the Secretary, since I was Governor, that was about uh, 10 years ago, and I find him to be a very dedicated public servant, uh, very humble, and I know his competency and his skills to lead this department. Uh, during his term, as uh, the FIBOC said, we were able to implement several programs in our province, and I'd like to thank him for that. I think he was able to visit uh, Surigao del Sur twice. Uh, so I give my 5,000% uh, support to Secretary Solidum. Thank you, Ano. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman Pimentel, for your very few words. Sir, Ano, um, Senator Allen would like to be recognized. Senator Gaetano is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to our Majority Leader and our Chair, Vice Chair. Magandang uh, po. Uh, actually, sir, kapitbahay ko kasi si Secretary at ang DOST. So, DOST, Camp Bagundiwa, tapos bahay namin nandun. So, pinapaalala ni Secretary sa akin na charity begins at home. Uh, but ako naman ang response ko sa kanya, I'm finally happy to see him na hindi kalamiti ang pinag-uusapan. Uh, 
no and sabi ko nga sa kanya anong difference ng uh, calamity at saka disaster so yung calamity is yung uh, ba yung uh, bagyo lindol ba yung mga natural and uh, man made pero ang disaster daw ay kung hindi susuportahan ng both houses ang DOST sa mga gusto nilang gawin uh, because uh, Senator Villar nga was asking me about DOST and uh, ba minsan yung mga research sa ibang departments proper medyo hindi naman ginagamit talaga sa research eh di ba kaya we don't get the results that we want but any of the modern and high tech companies now they spend so much on R&D so sa akin hindi lang manifestation of support uh, sa isang career official who worked his way up no but also a plea na maybe in uh, 2023 as we monitor how they are doing in 2024 we can really support a uh, bigger budget for the DOST so thank you for this uh, few minutes and uh, I hope na secretary that under your leadership maging isang salt and light ang DOST sa buong gobyerno thank you thank you Mr. Chairman thank you Senator Gaetano is there any other uh, inquiry thank you Secretary Solidum, you are now uh, excuse. <laughs> Sir, uh, ano lang before I move for your uh, recommend you, sir, uh, the Bicol Institute, uh, Bicol State College of Arts and uh, Science and Technology in Camarines Sur is now university. It's called Science Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia University of Technology. Sana the umbrella that you you gave to Bataan. Uh, uh, mabigay rin nyo ang tulong sa Bicol. Uh, however, um, when we started this uh, committee, all uh, all our topics have been discussed from Netflix to lava to robotics. So I think it's about time, uh, dear colleagues. Therefore, I move, Mr. Chair, to recommend to the plenary for the commission to confirm the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Omali Solidum Jr., Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. I so move, Mr. Chair. There is a motion, Julius Seconda, to recommend to the plenary for the commission to confirm the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Omali Solidum Jr. as Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. Is there any objection? Hearing none, same is approved. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there not being other matters to discuss, I move to adjourn the meeting. We will now have a lunch break and we will resume in 12.30. Uh, 12.45. 12.45. When we... A motion the majority leader without any objection. The meeting is hereby adjourned.
them in. Our first meeting uh, of, on the Committee on Transportation for the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. Secretary, will you please call the roll? The Honorable Members of the Committee on Transportation, Commission on Appointments, Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay, Representative Virginel G. Biron, MD, Senator Francis Chis G. Escudero, Senator Jingoy Ejercito Estrada, Representative Albert S. Garcia, Representative Greg G. Gasataya, Senator Christopher Bong Go, Senator Risa Ontiveros, Senator Loren Legarda, Representative Oscar Oka G. Malapitan, Senator Amy R. Marcos, Senator Grace Poe, Representative Jordin Jesus M. Romualdo, Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria, Senator Francis Tol. Okay, present. Senator Francis Tol N. Tolentino, Senator Cincha A. Villar, ex officio members, Representative Ramon N. Guico Jr., Representative Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villaferte Jr., Senator Joseph Victor G. Ejercito, Representative Rodante D. Marcoleta, Senator Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano, Representative Jose Gay G. Padjernos, Representative Johnny T. Pimentel, the chairperson is present. The chairman of the Commission on Appointments, Senate President Juan Miguel Migs F. Zubiri, is present. With uh, 12 persons or 12 members present in person, including the chair and uh, two members present online, with a total of 14 members, the existence of a quorum is hereby declared. The chair acknowledges uh, the presence, of course, of our SP, Senate President uh, Mig Subiri. Today, this committee will uh, deliberate an, uh, on the ad interim appointment of Mr. Jaime Jimenez Bautista as Secretary, Department of Transportation. May we invite Mr. Jaime Jimenez Bautista to please take the designated seat? Secretary, kindly report on the jurisdictional requirements and other pertinent information relative to the ad interim appointment of the appointee in compliance with the new rules of the commission and the rules of the standing committees. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Your Honors. On June 30, 2022, the Commission on Appointments received the ad interim appointment of Mr. Jaime Jimenez Bautista as Secretary, Department of Transportation. His ad interim appointment was duly published in two newspapers of general circulation at the Manila Times and Manila Standard on July 28 and 29, 2022, respectively, and broadcast over PTV4 station on 28 July 2022 at 7 p.m. pursuant to Section 2, Article 2 of the Rules of the Standing Committees. Likewise, his ad interim appointment was referred to... to by the Commission Chairperson, Senate President Juan Miguel Migs F. Zubiri to the Committee on Transportation for its appropriate action on 23 August 2022, pursuant to Section 16, Chapter 5 of the New Rules of the Commission. On October 6, 2022, the Commission on Appointments received the current ad interim appointment of Mr. Jaime Jimenez Bautista as Secretary, Department of Transportation, and on even date, the same was referred anew by the Commission Chairperson, Senate President Juan Miguel Mix F. Zubiri, to the Committee on Transportation for its appropriate action pursuant to Section 16, Chapter 5 of the New Rules of the Commission. The appointee has complied with the submission of the necessary documentary requirements as provided for in Section 24, Chapter 6 of the New Rules of the Commission on Appointments. No sworn opposition was filed against the ad interim appointment of the appointee. That is all, Madam Chairperson, Your Honors. Madam Secretary, please, admin, please administer. Oh. Huh? We'd like to acknowledge the presence of our Majority Floor Leader, Representative El Rey Villaferte. Madam Chairperson, uh, Madam Secretary, please administer the oath of Mr. Jaime Jimenez Bautista. Secretary Bautista, please stand and raise your light, right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you, God. Yes, I, yes, I do. 
Madam Chairperson, Your Honours, the appointee is now under oath. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Mr. Bautista, good afternoon. Finally, we have scheduled your confirmation, hopefully. Uh, you may now proceed with your introductory statement, if you have any. Honorable uh, Senate President uh, Miguel Subiri, Honorable uh, Madam Chairperson Representative uh, Lani Mercado Rivilla, members of the Commission on Appointments, good afternoon. I am uh, Jaime J. Bautista, appointee of His uh, Excellency President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr., as Secretary of the Department of Transportation. The separation of powers in a democratic republic such as ours contains as a necessary component not only the coordination of the executive, legislative, and judiciary branches, but also the review of its other actions, often referred to as checks and balances. Thus today, pursuant to this principle and in compliance with the provision of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, I humbly submit myself and my ad interim appointment for review of this commission and seek its consent and confirmation as Secretary of Transportation. I accept the challenge to lead a vital sector of our life and the economy, the transportation sector. Being an archipelago, land, sea, and air mobility are indispensable to our exchange of goods and services as well as our unity and cohesion as a people with shared goals among diverse local traditions and practices. I therefore present myself to the Commission for any question, comment, or guidance. Thank you very much, Your Honours. Good afternoon. Before we proceed, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Congressman Oka Malapitan. Okay, the point is now ready to respond to any comment or questions uh, coming from the members. Uh, so who among the members are going to uh, ask questions? We would like first probably to uh, request uh, the head of the minority from the Senate, Senator Alan Peter Cayetano. It's recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Magandang tanghali, magandang tanghali Mr. Secretary. Sabi po sa Biblia, kung anong ating itatanim, yun ang ating aanihin. And obviously, sa traffic na problema ng ating mga kababayan, eh, may mga mali tayong tinanim in the past, what, 100 years. And with the permission of my colleagues, I will just put a context po sa questions. I, I, I know we should always decide from a bird's eye view from a more nationalistic and holistic uh, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao uh, approach. Having said that, I think if we look from the point of view of an uh, ordinary commuter, whether it's a Metro Davao, Metro Cebu, sa Baguio, sa Metro Manila, excuse me, if we look from the point of view of the commuter, mas magkakaroon tayo ng uh, mas magagandang programa siguro at mas maganda itatanim natin. Let me start with the JICA, uh, the Japan International Cooperation Study in 2018 that said we are losing 3.5 billion pesos a day no? um, because of traffic in Metro Manila. And if interventions are not made, uh, 5.4 billion will be lost by a day by 2035, no? So dun sa mga nagtatanong na hindi ba masyadong mahal yung mga subway, LRT, MRT, more airports, uh, developing Clark, uh, developing uh, mga bus going to Bicol. Well, we're losing 3.5 billion a day. And Manila ranks 58 out of 60 in the 2022 Urban Mobility Readiness Index with a score of 31% which is below the global 53.7% and Asia-Pacific 51.9%. And factors dito are connectivity, public transit, uh, electrification, and automation. So, so from a point of view of commuter, yung pong bang palipat-lipat siya from tricycle to jeep to bus 
uh, getting from point to point is very difficult. And then, yun nga, yung mix between uh, private vehicles and uh, public vehicles. And of course, yung automation, no, na sa ibang bansa, isang beep card o isang uh, card lang sa lahat ng sasakyan, di ba? Sa atin, depende sa pupuntahan mo, iba-iba, uh, no? Developing countries uh, like Jakarta and Manila, sustainable mobility is less a priority uh, and motorized vehicles are likely to remain the most common and popular. No? So kung manunod tayo ng news, um, babasa ka sa Facebook, sa um, Instagram, uh, parang ang cars ang, uh, and car owners are the king uh, ng public opinion pagdating sa traffic. No? But Again, we should look at it from the point of view of an ordinary commuter. Um, Manila ranks 48 out of 60 in sustainable mobility and 56 out of 60 for public transit. So, bago po kayo, Secretary, and uh, napakahirap mag-umpisa na ganyan ang mga statistics. No? But looking at your resume, you're up for the challenge naman. No? Napakaganda naman ng inyong mga challenges at uh, achievements before. No? So let me start by asking you that um, do you have any studies in the pipeline since you got into office about the time of time and motion? Para mga malaman mo sa opisina mo, uh, gano kahirap or uh, ano ang travel time ng isang commuter? Let's say from Caloocan to Pasay or from Alabang to uh, Clark or wherever you're going. No? Um, did the, is there any ongoing study or is there a recent study commissioned by the DOTR to have a picture of a commuting, not only in Metro Manila, but in highly urbanized areas around the country? Thank you po sa inyong question, uh, Senator uh, Alan Peter Caetano. No? Uh, ang DOTR po ay uh, continuous po na tinitingnan namin yung mga current situations po. Ano? Uh, for uh, tinitingnan po namin yung tagal ng uh, travel time. No? From, uh, for example, Monumento to, to Pasay, no? And uh, ganun din po yung ibang mga ruta. No? Part po yan ng uh, aming uh, ginagawang review ng mga ruta. No? Uh, meron pong ganyang ginagawa ang uh, LTFRB, which is an arts agency of uh, the Department of Transportation. No? To clarify, sir, it's more of monitoring rather than a study. Uh, sa ngayon po, yeah. no monitor po. But, uh, Can I suggest no that you actually engage professionals to have a study? Kasi iba po yung, for example, yung existing routes ngayon. Magandang i-monitor yon pero baka dapat baguhin na yun. Actually po, merong isang grupo na nag-study nag po. Ano? Nagtimula pa po ito nung uh, nakaraang administrasyon. Hindi pa lang po tapos yung study. Hinihintay lang po namin yung resulta. Maybe it will help if you give the commission a copy of that. At ano yung scope niya? No? Which goes kasi to my second question. Eh. Does the DOTR compile the mistakes of the government as far as transportation in Metro Manila. The reason I ask that is kasi uh, as a young man, pinapayagan lang ako mag-overnight ng tatay ko sa Cebu. Nabot ko pa talaga, wala talagang, uh, wala, walang bahay. I think there's only beach, dalawang beach, uh, Argao and Tambuli sa, sa, Makta, sa Cebu and Mactan. And what happened to Metro Cebu na develop talaga ang ganda talaga lang yung mistakes natin in far as not having enough trains, uh, rapid bus, yung traffic na ulit lang. So I was wondering no as an institution is a DOTR you know make taking note of the mistakes that they did in Metro Manila rather than just trying to correct this pa sa planning niyo sa ibang lugar hindi na to maulit. <clears throat> Meron po kaming listahan ng mga problema po. No? Uh, na da, ito po yung resulta ng mga mistakes na nangyayari dito sa ating mga kalsada, sa ating rails and uh, sa lahat po ng uh, sector of transportation. No? Meron naman po and uh, ito po ay kinoconsider. In fact, uh, gagamitin po namin yan sa aming uh, strategic planning which uh, we will uh, do on uh, uh, bukas po, uh, bukas, uh, August 8 and August 9. So I think we'll be very interested in uh, 
the results of that sec because uh, when I was looking at the DPWH budget, I'm quite disappointed that um, pre by cam so 770 billion that a half of the budget new networks is maintenance. Starting this year, the name budget ng maintenance at new networks, parang 200 billion each. But there was a budget for convergence. So meaning kusan may airport at seaport, gagawa ng kalye, which is good news. But that's the same mistake in Metro Manila. So gumawa ng kalye papunta sa seaport at airport, pero hindi gumawa ng mga train punta doon. And um, of course, hindi pa naman mag appear sa budget ng DOTR until meron. But yun na po ang tanong ko. So when you have a master plan or a checklist, for uh, outside Metro Manila and Metro Cebu na pag gumawa kayo ng airport at gumawa ng bagong city or nagde-develop yung city, ito na yung model ng transportation para hindi na lang tayo replay ng replay. No? If you go to uh, Senator Nancy here, no? if you go to Ayala Avenue, for example, uh, you'd see the beauty of the development of the Ayala Corp ng Makati. But if you go, for example, to Cebu, you will see na may improvements. If you go to Fort Tagig, you'll see the improvements. If you go to Santa Rosa, you will see the improvements. It's still not perfect. So when they made the townships outside Ayala Avenue, outside Makati, sabi na, bigger roads para hindi traffic, pero inabutan din ng, ng traffic. But you could see the effort at makikita mo yung kakaiba. But if you go to the busy streets of Cebu, and you're in the busy streets of Manila, makikita mo, we just repeated the, 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 the same uh, mistakes. No? And I fear we're going to do the same thing. I'm quite happy with the economic numbers and the projections, and I'm hoping this administration will be successful. But isang byproduct kasi ng successful economic activity is traffic. Eh. No? And uh, it's not ordinary traffic na nasa kotse ka nagda-drive. It's really the commuter not being able to get from point A to point B uh, safely or comfortably. No? So yung mga executive dadating sa opisina, naka-aircon, nasa kotse, mabango. Pero yung mga empleyado nila, papagalitan nila, bakit late, uh, pawis na pawis and everything, or basa sa ulan. But actually, you know, and again, Sek, ano, this is not your fault. You're getting in to try to solve the problem. But it will be your fault if it happens in the cities we are developing. I'll ask specific questions after this question. But yun nga po, yung tanong ko dito, will the DOTR come out, uh, like the DICT for example, no? meron silang ilalabas na parang uh, template para sa smart city. Para may standard at meron na uh, simple. So, if you know uh, a governor was here or a group of mayors of a metro area asking you for a template, anong plano ng DOTR sa lugar nila, um, will the DOTR be able to hide them with one or baka rin tayo sa dati na tingi-tinging project? Oh, maganda dito, uh, rapid bus, maganda dito, ganito. So, you know, rather than a comprehensive approach, parang patingi-tingi ang ino-offer natin projects. What's your view on this, uh, Mr. Secretary? To the chair, uh, ngayon po ay uh, we are preparing a master plan po for uh, uh, rail, for uh, aviation, for maritime, and for land sector po. No? Uh, in fact po, yan nga po yung isa sa pag-uusapan namin uh, tomorrow and uh, Friday, no? para magkaroon po talaga ng master plan. No? In fact po, nung... Uh, hearing namin sa Congress, uh, isa din po yan sa mga question, no? na kailangan magkaroon nga tayo ng uh, tamang master plan for all the sectors. No? Kasi po, uh, kung minsan yung mga projects natin, uh, naisip lang na gawin, but uh, hindi talaga napag-aralang mabuti. No? So, very important po yan. Uh, ganyan po ang naging experience po namin sa private sector, na kailangan talagang uh, napag-aralang mabuti, may master plan, so that uh, walang masyadong problema sa implementation. Secretary, I understand if that is a, a foreign agency like JICA, no? But um, kasi naka six months na rin kayo, so hindi ba step one naman yun? Pagpasok nyo, may existing 
master plan ba by previous administrations, the Aquino administration, the Duterte administration, maybe way back to the uh, Royal administration. So uh, right now, ano ang working draft niyo for the uh, master plan? Uh, actually po, we, uh, we will work with uh, ADB po. Uh, and uh, ask them for uh, we, have, we have we have started uh, talking yeah. to them. Excuse me. Uh, we... Anyway, I think you get the point. Uh, and... Excuse me. Uh, for the information, there was an earthquake, and uh, we the building uh, as, is asking everybody to evacuate at this point. So we'd like to uh, suspend uh, the meeting uh, until we go. Uh, uh, but we should have better the... transportation. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Senator. The epicenter is in Jose Panganiban, Camarines Norte. So, we'd uh, like to suspend uh, today's hearing till uh, further notice, till we are uh, requested to come back inside the building. Thank you so much.
Cayetano no, to proceed with your uh, questions uh, to Secretary uh, Jimmy Bautista. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, Senator Nancy request that walang replay. So recap na lang, Secretary. No? I asked about a master plan and studies. And to be very honest, Mr. Secretary, um, I don't believe kasi sa bara-bara, but sabi nyo nga meron. So maybe um, in the next hearing lang, uh, provide us kung ano nga itong mga master plan or studies or uh, data that you already have. Uh, I just want to make sure na very scientific yung, yung approach natin sa transportation given na we just keep asking the same questions and doing the same thing and then kung saan man maging highly urbanized, whether yan ay sa Pampanga, whether yan ay sa uh, Cagayan, whether yan ay sa Baguio, paulit-ulit na lang tayo. And when you have a new secretary, it's always an opportunity uh, to address all of this. So having said that, secretary, Again, talking about yung paulit-ulit, uh, how many times nakapagbigay na ng fuel subsidy sa tricycle drivers nung time nyo uh, from June 32 now? We'd like to request that the microphone of Secretary Bautista be fixed. Uh, before uh, he answers the question, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Congressman Marcoleta. Go continue, Secretary. Is, is, is his microphone working already? Yes. And also, uh, Senator Jingoy Estrada. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Secretary. To the chair, with the permission of the chair, uh, we have a uh, a fuel subsidy of uh, 2.5 billion pesos, which uh, we were able to distribute uh, almost all of this to drivers. So, ano, except for yung tricycle, no? uh, there are uh, tricycle drivers that uh, we have given only to around uh, 6,000 because uh, we're working for uh, DI DILG for them to submit to us the list. Uh, of uh, the tricycle drivers po. There's a, uh, there, meron pa pong balance around 100 million pesos that we have not distributed. Yes. No? Well, Secretary, number one, uh, masama tama sa jeep, masama tama sa taxi, napakasama ng tama sa tricycle. No? Uh, why? Because nakasiksik ng tricycle, so from the lockdown, after the lockdown, oh. uh, not only um, hindi sila everyday pinapasakay. Pag kami minimize mo yung sakay nila, alas wala na rin kinikita. But that's the point I wanted to make. No? Bakit tayo nagkakaganyan? No? That every single city and municipality has a list of tricycle na may prangkisa. So bakit hindi ginawa ng LTO and there's a new head now, na kunin nyo na yung list and then every time na mag-announce tayo ng subsidy, sasabihin nyo lang sa LGU, eto yung present list, may amendment ba kayo? May bago ba dyan o napalitan? So, looking at your resume, I don't think you ever excused inefficiency in the private sector. In the private sector, pag may inefficiency, mawawalan ka ng kliyente. So just because we're in government now, papayagan ba natin yan? So, you, you already have had six months to be secretary Ayag ba tayo ng ganyan yung sistema? Ay, isang tawag lang yan eh. When I was secretary ng DFA, ganyan din nangyari. I would... Kakalabitin ko yung ibang secretary, sabi ko, pasensya na ha. Tawagan ko mga yusek at asik nyo at sasabihin ko, ba't ang bagal-bagal? Then I'll give them a deadline. I'll apologize for talking that way, but I'll tell them, I o'clock today, I want that on my desk. Di ba? So, by your next hearing, can you assure us that uh, the list of all tricycle drivers will be in your office para alam natin kung magkano sa 2.5 billion sa 2023 ang mapupunta naman sa tricycle drivers? Uh, through the chair po, uh, 
we will uh, get all the list po. Ang, ang naging problema po doon, uh, actually po, ay yung uh, ability natin to pay them. No? Kasi po ang payment namin na ginagawa ay through GCAS or through Land Bank of the Philippines. No? And, uh, Sir, magpalit tayo ng posisyon. Ikaw ang senador, ako ang secretary. Do you want to hear excuses or solutions? Uh, solutions po. Ano? Because you ask any congressman here, ha? bigay niyo yung pera, tomorrow i-distribute namin sa lahat ng uh, tricycle driver. So whatever is more convenient, kung mas convenient na Gcash, Palawan Express, Thai, whatever, or kung mas uh, convenient mano-mano, we will give it there. So th that's my point, sir. We want the Jaime Bautista who was in the private sector. Dapat yung private sector executive mo ba involved ng DOTR? Hindi yung usual red tape ng gobyerno maapektuhan si Jaime Bautista today. So, I know you're mild-mannered. That's why we're answering that way. But for me, people are fed up with excuses. Eh. Diba? So, the first six months, basa sila ng basa sa dyaryo, naririnig sa dyaryo, may fuel subsidy, pero ang tricycle driver, wala. Eh, Pinaka-organized sa Pilipinas ang TODA. Uh, JODA is also organized, no? but ang, ang TODA are very highly organized. No? So it will be very, very easy to distribute. Kung ayaw nyo mag -Gcash, you just get the list from uh, the municipality or city. You give them the money. Doon mismo sa pila, pwede nilang i-distribute yun. So I think you get my point on Secretary, no? but ang so, if every single time na lang mag-announce ng presidente o gobyerno na may subsidy at sasabihan ka ng DOT o kakayong listahan, di ba? Eh, parang naman tayo mga loko nag-uusap dito. So, if you tell me that there are 10, 15, 20% variance dahil nga nare-retire yung ibang tricycle driver o yung, uh, yung may hawak ng prangkisa, hindi yung gumagamit, we understand that, di ba? But 80% of the list are the same. Kung sinong binigyan dati, yun ang binigay. That's why nga sa ayuda, I've been saying, why do we have uh, X to add um, SLP, fuel? Why not just give people 10,000 the way we did during the pandemic? No? Pero sabi nga, targeted tayo. Pero kung targeted, pero hindi nakakasama sa target yung pinakamalaking grupo, then target tayo, set, di ba? No. So, I mean, I, I cannot see why LTFRB or LTO cannot talk to the uh, Municipal Mayor's League and the City Mayor's League and say na pag hindi nyo sinabmit, wala kayo. At lang ganun, ang sisisihin ng tricycle drivers, yung mayors nila. Mm -hmm. Kasi hindi nagsubmit eh. It, it, it's that easy sec eh. So, I, I really don't know why we would have a hard time uh, delivering this when it's, it's being done, no? In fact, taxi drivers, mas mahirap pagbigyan kasi wala silang asosasyon na na still organized ng TODA. May mga asosasyon sila na malalaki, pero per group of owners yan, may taxi driver na isa lang ang taxi, may taxi company na isang libo yung units. Pero hindi sila katulad ng TODA na every single city municipality has TODAs and every one of them have federations. Very, very well organized yan. Para din yung... Uh, uh, Ganyan senior citizens at saka PWD sa mga cities, they're, they're quite organized. So, may request that the Secretary look into this para nga we make sure that sa 2.5 billion in 2023, at least in the first quarter or as soon as ma-release ng DBM, magkaroon ng subsidy ang ating mga tricycle drivers. To the chair po. Uh, Mr. Senator po, yung uh, we have requested po from uh, the DILG the list no. Uh, ang difference po ng uh, taxi at sa mga bus operators, meron po kaming listahan yan sa LTFRB no. Yun pong mga tricycle po, uh, this is uh, through the local governments po yan no. Uh, and uh, we have requested the local governments no. And uh, ito nga po, uh, siguro... Again, Mr. Secretary, no? uh, I don't want to be unfair kay Secretary ng DILG Ben Hur because he's not here. Mm -hmm. But assuming na request mo hindi niyo binibigay, so that's still an excuse. Ayan mga congressman, no? You ask the congressman to submit to you. They will call their mayors. Their mayors will give you the list. So, ang point ko, Sec, I'm not comfortable confirming someone who will give us excuses. And I gave you the chance two minutes ago, no? So either you can get the list or not. 
we will get. You know, if you put it in your Facebook today, that first come first serve lahat ng city and municipality na mag-submit ng list. Mabilis pa sa alas 4. Nasa inyo na yung list. Bakit po? Because ang LTO po ay nakadelegate na ngayon sa cities and municipalities ang franchise ng tricycle. At lahat po yan ay nasa record ng kanilang franchise office. It's it's in a flash drive. So like if you tell me if you tell me that um you will uh, give Tagig and Pateros subsidy as soon as we give. I can call the two mayors now. They will give me a flash drive in 15 minutes. I can give it to you. So, yun lang ang point ko, Sek, no? Kailangan ganun yung ating attitude sa gobyerno. Kasi kung hindi, delay ng delay yan, no? Which, I'll, I'll move to my second point kasi I think that's my point naman, no? Ano po ang, ang inyong completion date or yung launch date ng uh ng subway metro manila subway yung pong through the chair uh with, your, with the permission of the chair yun pong subway uh, we're looking uh completion in uh 2028 or 2029 how come why did it move during your time jica and the dot are already uh approved 2007 bakit nilipat na 2008 uh, 2000, sorry, 2027. So, why did you leave 2028? Why a year delay under your administration? Uh, through the chair. Uh, ito po yung uh, estimate namin dahil hindi po nasunod yung uh, uh, start ng boring machine. Uh, in fact po, yung uh, boring machine natin uh, should have started a uh, year ago. But uh, unfortunately... Mr. Secretary, po, please... Uh, check your facts because right before Sek Tugadet left office on June 30, tinanong ko yun, and uh, they're on schedule for 2027. And in fact, ang sinabi niya sa akin nun, Alan, hindi dapat magbago to because ang gobyerno parating may excuse. So pagka sila ay pinusigin mo ng 2007, malate man yan, pero pag yan ay pinayagan mong uh, madelay, madidelay yan. The 2027 already inputted the delay, and that was approved by the Japanese in 2027. It was only during the time na pinayagan nyo na maging 2829. Uh, with the permission of the chair, uh, ang report po sa amin, ang delay is uh, unang-una because of the pandemic po. No? So, check, that's why I'm, I'm giving you a chance. Check it with your people. Because I talked to Sek Tugade before the June 30. So nag-iba yung assessment ng DOTR nung nag-iba yung administrasyon. So do not say it's because of the pandemic. Because this was right before June 30, nung sinabing 2027. Yung mga hapon, yung approved to. So whoever reported to you is telling you something different. Na hindi kaya. It was telling Secretary Tugade something different. Maybe after this hearing, you can call Sek Tugade and you can compare notes. No? So, I'll ask the same thing sa Bicol Express. Kailan ang inyong target? You, through the chair po? Yes. Uh, yung Bicol Express po ay uh, magkakaroon din po ng uh, delay kasi po ay uh, hindi po na-approvan yung loan. No? Yung pong uh, loan ng uh, Philippine government uh, was not uh, approved by uh, China. No? So, yun po, uh, because of this, uh, we are uh, still uh, uh, assessing uh, the delay po. Yes. Yan naman po public yan, yung hindi nagkasundo sa interest rate. No? So, siguro po, give us an update there. Uh, and I hope we learn from what happened sa North Rail. Sa North Rail kasi parang may sinabing corruption. Natanggal na yung mga tao na na-relocate na. Pagdating nung Aquino administration, kinancel yung project. Natalo so, tayo sa arbitration, nagbayad pa tayo, then itutuloy din pala natin. So yung naging problema natin sa corruption, dodoble pa yung gastos ngayon. So it's good to fight corruption, but it's not good to stop a project and look at all of these complications. But in this case, 
Back to Femra, that is before your time yung, uh, yung problem dyan sa ano, but I, I think the majority leader was from uh, Kamsur no, will also take up yung, uh, yung uh, real ways to, to be called, no? Mr. Sec, I was looking at the sauna and I was looking at the pronouncements of the president and I assume that this is being fed by the the OTR then yung mga railways no and outside metro manila there is no mention of the clark subic railway so may i ask will this be part of something you're looking into or nasa pipeline ba to or scrap ito uh, sa ngayon po ay uh, nasa pipeline pa rin po yan no uh, in fact po pinag-usapan niya amin yan ng uh, BCDA and uh, DOF no uh, po, one of the reasons for uh, the uh, the non-implementation of this is also we don't have the loan po that was uh, not renewed by China. Yeah. No? So this, ato po ay check just to correct you. Ah, hindi hindi approved ng China. Hindi tayo nagkasundo sa rates. So hindi approved ng China yung rates ng gusto natin. No? Uh, having said that, that is something that I expect that we be honest about because while it is true that the Japanese rates are much lower than the Chinese rates, iba ang cost per kilometer ng Japanese at saka ng Chinese rail. Have you been briefed on that? On magkano per kilometer, for example, of apples to apples na rail of China versus Japan? Uh, to the chair. Uh... When we met po with uh, the Japanese ambassador, no, uh, he was telling us that uh, we should not only look at the interest rate, no, because uh, we should look at the total cost of uh, uh, the infrastructure, no, which will include uh, construction, not only uh, loan interest, no, the materials, the labor, no, and uh, he was telling us that uh, if you consider total cost. It will be cheaper than uh, uh, Japanese uh, than uh, cost if you have it financed through JICA. In a put on sec. So if I ask the OTR, uh, magkano ang rail apples to apples, so MRT to MRT type, LRT to LRT type, or ano magagamitin niyo sa Bicol Express? Is that a standard gauge or narrow or? Uh, through the chair, yun pong uh, PNR uh, uh, from Clark to uh, to uh, Subic, uh, gagamitin po natin yung standard gauge okay. po yan. No? So, alam mo, sir, standard gauge na China, magkano per kilometer versus standard gauge ng Japanese per kilometer? Magkano po? You, you can, by the way, you can use your resource people. I don't, uh, some of the facts I expect you to know. Uh, sec, just as you will expect us to know some things at the back of our head, but many of the technical things, especially that you've just been there six months, um, feel free po na tawagin yung tao niyo sa likod, uh, technical people to to help you on it. No? If we will compare po the, the project that we have right now, yeah. uh, uh, the, the North-South Meter railway, which is uh, financed by uh, ADB and JICA, these are uh, elevated railway. Po, no, uh, the uh, Clark to Subic po is uh, just uh, uh, on the ground. No, so hindi po apple to apple lang. Yes, I'm not natin, asking so. you to compare the two. Mm -hmm. So assuming na may may bagong rota, both the Chinese and the Japanese are vying for it and willing to provide for loans and willing to help us. Input mo na lahat. For example, sa Japanese side, may consultant na kasama yan, di ba, that you have to get from them. Oh. Magkano per kilometer yung rail from the Chinese side, standard gauge, at magkano pag from the Japanese side? That, that, that information should be readily available to the DOTR, di ba? Uh, you um... want to get back to us on that? We'll, uh, we'll uh, ask lang po the, uh, our people. But no? you don't have any technical people here with you? They should know that. Ah. Yes. Uh, yung uh, at grade and not electrified po is 2 billion per kilometer, while elevated and electrified is 4 billion per kilometer. And that's Japanese or Chinese? Yung pong uh, Japanese po is 4 billion. Uh, Chinese is 2 billion per kilometer on uh, the ground. 
Sorry, sir. Pakayunatulet. So, pag on the ground, pag on the ground po uh, through a uh, Chinese uh, contractor, it will be uh, two billion per kilometer. No? While uh, the elevated uh, railway po is four billion per kilometer. Uh, pag Chinese. Pag Japanese. Po. Japanese. Pag Chinese. Pag uh, yun pung wala po kami Chinese uh, contractor po for uh, the elevated. Uh, yeah, also for in the elevated. Yung Chinese po is 2 billion. Uh, 2, 2 billion. 2 billion per kilometer. And then the Japanese? Yung Japanese po, we have not uh, asked them uh, but, because... But, but sir, parang bibili ka ng aeroplano sa pal niyan eh, di ba? So, di ba, hindi mo makukompare exacto ang Boeing at saka ang uh, Airbus. Mm -hmm. Pero yung Katumbas niya, ibibigay sa'yo pressure so that you will decide which one you will get. So, you cannot tell us today that you do not know the apples for apples price between the Chinese and the Japanese because both of them are offering and the national government is debating in accordance with interest rates. So, diba? So, sa Senado, when we approve your budget, ang problema namin, loans to lahat. So, i-approve namin yan pag nagbabayad na. Hindi katulad pag yan ay, let's say, DPWH project. Sa umpisa pa lang, hinihimay na namin yan, tinitignan na namin yan. Bakit iba ang presyo ng farm-to-market road per kilometer dito sa road network, for example, ng DPWH? Then they have to explain. So, hindi dalawa drainage yan, mas maliit yan, etc. No? So, I, I really cannot see, Seth, why you cannot give us now an apple for apples. You mean, sa tagal ng DOTR gumagawa ng train since the 1980s, we do not compare the prices? In the, if, that's, if that's the case, that's so irresponsible of us as a government. And we're not only talking about Japanese and Chinese. So, for example, if the Germans want to come in, or the Koreans, or the Australians, and they have, hindi natin compare yung price. To the chair po. No? Uh, based po dun sa aming discussion with the uh, Chinese uh, ambassador, no? They can be cheaper daw po by around 20 to 30 percent. So everyone will push their interest. Eh? Mm -hmm. So the Chinese will push their interest, the Japanese will push their interest, the U.S. and their allies will, will push their interest. But we have to protect our own interest. And the only way to do that is for us to have our individual assessment of ano talaga mas mura at lahat ipapa ipapasok na natin doon. I mean... I discussed this also in private with DPWH because SEC Bunoan um, used to handle foreign assisted. So ko, SEC, ang laki ng mga inuutang natin and nagpapasalamat tayo, tamang pasalamat tayo, but hindi ba we have to hire their consultant? And then, they also get Filipino subcontractors. So sabi ko, habang buhay na lang ba, ganito na lang ang, ang sistema sa Pilipinas. So thank you sa Japanese and Chinese all that they've done to help, including uh, the Nino Aquino Airport, the Dibayong, and all other infrastructure. You know? But having said that, Sec, how do we get better without independent assessment? You know? So if we're not ready today, it's the next hearing back, and you meet with your technical people, and can they... Because, of course, the Chinese ambassador will say we'll have it cheaper, but is it apples to apples? Right? Because there are all kinds of trains eh, and there's all kinds of quality then. So after talking to that, I, sa DFA, ganun din na experience ko. Then the Japanese will, but better in quality namin. Then the Chinese will invite me to China to try their train to show that it is of the same or better quality. So that's why it's so important na meron tayong sariling uh, assessment. At kung hindi natin kaya, then we can get a European, for example, who na mahilig din sa railways na Europeans, Make an independent assessment that include everything, you know? Fees, charges, interest rate, data, consultants, etc. A Japanese rail cost ganito per kilometer and Chinese ganito. Uh, so that we can actually plan you mix natin. How much do we borrow from the Chinese? How much do we borrow from the from the Japanese? Diba? I, I, Madam Chair, parang hindi ko lang ma-accept today na in comparison apples to apples. Hindi ko ma-accept na kasi pagkita sa baba, eto. So, I get what the secretary means. Tinitignan lang niya yung data ngayon based on yung existing. Pero hindi man pwedeng makungutan tayo sa isang bansa na hindi natin nakikita 
kung yung kabila ba ay malaki ang mas mura sa kabila o mas maganda yung quality. No? Can I just add to the comment of Senator Alan? Is it true that the South Rail, Manila to Bicol, the Manila to Kalamba is Japanese funded and the Kalamba to Bicol is Chinese? With the permission of the chair, uh, yung pong uh, Manila to Kalamba is uh, funded by uh, ADB. Which is, uh, sinong, who will, uh, what technology? Japanese? Uh, ito po ay uh, Japanese uh, technology po. No? Uh -huh. uh, yung Bicol to... Uh, Kalamba to Bicol. Kalamba to Bicol po. Uh, ang plano po dito, which uh, nagsimula po doon at sinimula ng previous government, ay uh, true uh, Japanese tech uh, Chinese technology po. Anyway, siguro we're running out of time but uh, sir uh, why uh, how come the Manila Colomba passengers will be Japanese be I think better technology and lilipat sila baka I mean you know I think you should just consider uh, from Manila to Bicol via Colomba in eh, one funding agency and one contractor no just a suggestion but with uh, due respect to our senator Alan we still have to uh, we have to tackle around 61 uh, officials from the DFA, uh, particularly eight ambassadors and other officials. Uh, with all due respect to Senator Alan and uh, our colleagues, uh, Madam Chair, for lack of material time. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Senate President. Yes, sorry. We're, first of all, we apologize, Secretary. It was forced major. We didn't know it was going. Your hearing is so dramatic that uh, nagkaroon ng earthquake <laughs> na may impact talaga. So, but we're really running out of time because there's 61 foreign officials, foreign affairs officials that still be appointed. We'll invite you back again next week uh, the soon as possible time to join us here to answer the questions. Um, but I have only one concern. I was in the airport last week because I had a checkup. I went to Singapore. Boss, binulungan ako ng OOTS ninyo. All the OTS in the security, they have not been paid for over a month. And they're saying, Sir, tulungan mo kami. Hindi, hindi pa kami na babayaran ng sweldo namin. Sabi ko, gano'n katagal? Isang buwan, yung isa, isa't kalating buwan. I think that's a labor issue. That's already, that's already a very serious labor issue. Uh, so, Madam Chair, uh, yes, uh, before you end, uh, after you end, uh, Mr. Um, yes. Yun lang, I just wanted to let you know that. I'm sure you don't know it, uh, Secretary. So uh, please uh, let them know that they have to pay the salaries. It's Christmas time. We get be Scrooge McDuck, you know, in this time of uh, Christmas. Uh, to the chair, may I respond to that, uh, Senate President? Uh, nagkaroon po ng konting problema sa release ng budget, no? But uh, it was already approved last Friday, no? And uh, sinimula na pong magbayad uh, nung Monday and yesterday. No? Madam Chair, May I have just two minutes for one question and then yung iba kong question baka I can send the secretary in written form to save us time next time. But can I just pursue one or two questions, two minutes lang? Go ahead, uh, Senator Alan Peter. Just because of lack of time, isang naging issue sa commission lately is the formal or informal advisors surrounding the secretary because... Um, we might believe in the integrity of the Secretary, and as I said naman, tinitingnan ko record mo, very outstanding naman. Uh, but of course, the people who are working with you or under you, no? So, is it true that right now you're not holding office sa DOTR office sa uh, Clark, but you're holding office sa CAAP? Uh, through the Chair, uh, it's true po that uh, most of the time uh, I hold office in CAAP, no? Okay, so is it true that there is a room there where we have six consultants who are not official consultants who are your advisors and they go there almost every day? Uh, through the chair, uh, meron po akong consultant. Hindi naman po six, no? I have uh, one consultant yeah. po na... And is it true one of them is uh, a controversial former uh, customs official, uh, Lito Alvarez? Well, uh, never po na pumunta si Lito Alvarez sa office namin. Yes, but is he one of those helping you plan the OTR? Hindi, Hindi naman po. Okay. So who, who are this one or this is six people sa kaap? Isa, isa lang po yung aking uh, personal consultant. No? Yeah. Uh, so ipapasok mo rin siya, sir? 
eventually or in hindi that. po siguro yeah. uh, he's a personal friend no okay so it's just so, advising you more of an advisor than more, a more an advisory po yeah but sec aren't you using the DOTR office in Clark the, the reason I ask you this is you know I'm a big supporter of DOTR moving to Clark it it actually lessened the traffic in Ortigas it actually hastened other agencies mo moving to Clark and it's a very good symbolism and we're trying to get other departments no, uh, to do there. So, I mean, I think it was a factor when you accepted the job na ang DOTR is now based in uh, Clark. So, I mean, if you make a decision to move back to Manila, I guess that's your choice or between you and the president. But to, is it true na once ka palang na pumunta sa Clark, sa office niyo doon? Through the chair. Hindi naman po once. No? Uh, I've been there uh, a few <laughs> times. No? Most of the time po talaga nandito ako sa CAP. Oh, maybe so, because of me. Mas pero lang ka dito sa area na to. Mas marami pong yeah. uh, mga meetings dito sa Manila. No? Especially meeting with uh, mga mga diplomats. No? And uh, uh, I, I thought that uh, it will be easier for them uh, for meeting here in Manila. And most of the meetings po talaga are in Manila. And uh, uh, another reason po uh, for uh, our decision to move the office to Manila is because we ask our people, no? 70% of the people uh, are uh, staying here in Manila. We have uh, 12 buses that uh, leaves uh, Manila every day from uh, different points in Metro Manila, uh, transporting around 800 people. And uh, when I ask uh, uh, their opinion, 70% uh, wanted to uh, uh, move to Manila because uh, most of them, uh, they said uh, they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning for them to be able to take... I, I, uh, I understand that, sec, at Mabigat na decision. If I was in your position, of course, I will ask my employees, but leadership then, sec, eh, kasi nga... Hindi mawawala ng traffic sa Metro Manila if we do not develop places outside. And for me, kudos to DOTR kasi yung ibang uh, departments, nanalo si President Duterte, gusto din nilang labas ng Metro Manila pero hindi nila ginawa. But ang DOTR ginawa nila. And one way to really decongest Metro Manila. So for, kung ako masusunod for example, I'd like DMD to be in Subic or at least the Navy, para facing the, South, the West Philippine Sea. I, I'd like the Department of Agriculture to either be in Nueva Ecija, where is the rice uh, basket, or, uh, or uh, you know, um, you, you get my meaning, Sec, but I, I won't belabor the point. Uh, ang point ko lang po, siguro, make the decision, then uh, justify it. But mahirap naman po na officially, doon pa yung office ng DOTR, and then dito kayong every day, no? Uh, having said that, Sec, we're not here naman to micromanage. And I said, uh, you're an accomplished uh, executive in the private sector. I just want to see more of that, no? More of that. So, I mean, if decided na ang hub na namin will be in Clark, no? Uh, so, for example, no? The, the, the Bulacan Airport, uh, very good yung marketing and they're offering land to people who will move uh, there. So, you know, if if I uh, knew that DOTR was moving back to Manila, I would offer Bulacan. Pero ano namang itsura yun na ang Clark, ang pagmamayari eh, uh, gobyan, no? Nilipat. I'm not saying nilipat ka doon, but you get my point, di ba? Na hindi pwedeng every administration that change, we change the whole policy. And I think even this administration, ang policy to congest. Uh, Maybe, just like BOST before you, no? Um, Palakat, may office sila sa Quezon City, may office sila sa Taguig. So, some want one building at dun lahat, but some want it scattered uh, around them. And right now, kasi, sec, nasanay na rin ang tao mag-online, eh. So, yes, sa diplomats and some, kailangan face-to-face, -face, pero marami din namang uh, pwede din naman na online. But, I won't belabor the point, and uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, Senate thank President. Thank you very for much, that. Uh, Senator you. Allen. We'd like to recognize Senator Grace. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I would like to say that I spoke to 
representatives of your competitor airline when you were still in the private sector. And they told me that they really trust you. And they would rather have somebody who understands the industry, uh, transportation, although your expertise, of course, is air. Um, in general, they vouch for your ability. Now, I, uh, just a, a reminder, because it's the holidays already, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are a lot of concessionaires in the airport don't accept um, credit cards or, AT or, or debit cards. Cash lang. So, napapaisip ako, baka ayaw nila mabisto yung earnings nila, pero bakit papayagan niya ng, ng airport manager? It's so inconvenient for passengers who don't have cash, particularly if we are encouraging tourists. Parang against yata yun, tapos pupunta sa ATM, yung ATM hindi gumagana. I mean, things like that. And then another thing is, the gridlock is usually in immigration. That's not your... Um, department, but maybe you can talk to them. Now, instead of doing the old school three shifts or two shifts, maybe best is, meron namang report when are the peak times, deploy more, open more windows. Uh, just as simple as that, I think it will help declog the airports during the holiday. And that's just my comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, any response uh, to that, Secretary? Uh, through the chair, uh, we have already uh, worked with the uh, MIA po, no? and uh, we are requesting uh, all concessionaires to accept credit card or GCAS. No? Uh, yung pong lumabas na blog, no? uh, actually po ang pinakita lang niya yung mga hindi nag accept ng CAS. No? But there are also uh, many establishments that also accept uh, credit card and GCAS. Po. Okay. So... Madam Chair... Just a manifestation to the committee. Yes. Because one thing that I will ask the secretary to brief me on is duty free. Okay. Because ever since you know, sina sabi ng Hapon, Koreano, uh, Chinese that uh, they're big shoppers. Pero bakit hindi mapaganda yung duty free? Not only in Metro Manila but all over. So I don't know kung uh, ano yung actual jurisdiction ng DOTR, but I will ask as a cabinet member. Brief me, but if uh, gusto ng ibang committee members, I'd be more than happy to to have a joint briefing. Because I ko, isa sa malaking kapulangan natin yan. If you go around the world, the uh, best brands, most expensive brands, etc., makikita mo na sa airports at malaki talaga gumastos yung mga turista sa sa airports. Pero sa atin, parang parang na post ayon ng 1990s, kung ano duty free noon, parang uh, ganun pa rin. No? At minsan, mas mura pa sa ibang uh, retail sa sa mga stores, kaso sa duty free. Parang, parang eh, bakit nabibili sa duty free? No? Parang may, may problema doon, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Allen. With that, I'd like to uh, recognize our majority for leader. Thank you, Dr. Amapin duty free yung mga damit doon, retro po. Ten years ago. <laughs> anyway, Madam Chair, for lack of material time, and considering there are still other members who want to propound questions on the appointee, I move to suspend the deliberation on the interim appointment of Secretary Jaime Jimenez Bautista as Secretary of the Department of Transportation until further notice, Madam Chair. I so move. Uh, are there any objections? Hearing none, our... Uh... Hearing is suspended till uh, further notice till next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
The fourth meeting of the uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs of the Commission on Appointments in the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The Honorable Officers and Members of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Vice Chairperson, oh no, Members, oh sorry, Vice Chairperson, Senator Maria Lourdes Nancy S. Binay. Representative for Janelle G. Biron, MD. Senator Christopher Bongo. Senator Lauren Legarda. Representative Rodante D. Marcoleta. Representative Lani Mercado Revilla. Representative Jose Gagey Padjernos. Senator Francis Toll N. Tolentino. Members, Senator Francis G. G. Escudero. Representative Albert S. Garcia. Representative Greg G. Gasataya. Senator Risa Ontiveros. Representative Oscar Oka G. Malapitan. Senator Amy R. Marcos. Senator Grace O. Present. Representative Jordin Jesus M. Romualdo. Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria. Senator Cincha A. Villar. Ex officio members, Vice Chair Person, Representative Ramon N. Guico Jr. Present. Majority Floor Leader, Representative Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villafuerte Jr. Yeah. Assistant Majority Floor Leader, Senator Joseph Victor G. Ejercito. Minority Floor Leader, Senator Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano. Assistant Minority Floor Leader, Representative Johnny T. Pimentel. The Chairperson is present. The Chairman of the Commission, Senate President Juan Miguel Mix F. Zuiri, is present. Senator Barilla, present. Bing, what up, Bing? Okay, na? Okay. Okay, na? Okay, na? With uh, 19 members present in person, including the chair, and one member present online, with a total of 20 members present, the existence of a quorum is hereby declared. Majority floor leader. <laughs> Chair, I move to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the meeting held on September 28, 2022, and consider the same as approved. There is a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the previous meeting and, could, and consider the same as approved. Is there any objection? There being none, the reading of the minutes of the meeting held on September 28, 2022 is dispensed with and the same is considered approved. Esteemed members of the Commission, on appointments, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good, morning, good afternoon. Today, the your Committee on Foreign Affairs will deliberate on the nominations and add interim appointments to the following Foreign Service officials, the Department of Foreign Affairs, listed according to ranks and dates of complete submission of the mandatory documents, namely, number one, Teodoro Lopez Loxin, Jr., Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland with concurrent jurisdiction over Ireland, Isle of Man, Bailiwick of Jersey, and Bailiwick of Guernsey with the salary and emoluments of a, of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Number two, Manuel Antonio Javier Tihanki, Permanent Representative of the, of the Republic of the Philippines to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland with the salary and emoluments of Chief of Mission Class 1. Number three, Jaime Adriano Flor Cruz, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the People's Republic of China, with concurrent jurisdiction over the, over the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Mongolia, with the salary, salary and emoluments of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Number four, Maria Andrelita Sacramento Austria, Chief of Mission Class 1 as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Canada. Number 5, Evangelina Lourdes Arroyo Bernas, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Austria, with, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Croatia, Republic of S Slovenia, and Slovak Republic, with the salary and emoluments of, of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Number 6, Celeste Vinson Balatbat, Chief of Mission, Class 2, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Chile, with concurrent juris jurisdiction over the Republic of Ecuador and the Republic of Peru. Number 7, 
Jose Almodovar Cabrera III, Chief of Mission Class II, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the State of Kuwait. Is he here? Okay. Number eight, Roberto Gutierrez Manalo, Chief of Mission Class II, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Islamic Republic of Iran, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Turkmenistan and the Republic of Uzbekistan. Number nine, Belinda Mariano Ante, Chief of Mission Class II, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste. Number 10, Maria Agnes Maglasang Cervantes, Chief of Mission Class II as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Islamic Republic of Pakistan with concurrent jurisdiction over the Is Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, the Kriegs Republic, and the Republic of Tajikistan. Good luck. <laughs> Number 11. <laughs> Leo Tito Lunar Ausan Jr., Chief of Mission Class II as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the People's Republic of Bangladesh, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka and the Republic of Maldives. Number 12. Anne Halandoon Lewis, Enjoy. Chief of Mission Class II, ex Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Bahrain. And the ad interim appointments of Kira or Kyra Christine Danganan Azucena, Chief of Mission Class I. Why not? Enrico Trinidad Force, Chief of Mission Class One. Are those who are virtually present, can you please? Uh, Stand, stand up when your names are mentioned, please. Herminia Aguilar Usudan, Chief of Mission Class 2. Lolita Bugnot Capco, Chief of Mission Class 2. Laila Laura Santos, Chief of Mission Class 2. Pamela Durian Bailon, Career Minister. Conrado Batara Demdem Jr., Career Minister. Susana Maria Lopez Mendiola, Career Minister. Ruel Urmeneta Gunabe, Career Minister. Greg Madi Concha Marino, Career Minister. Shirley Luanag Flores, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Fatima Guzman Quintin, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Robert De Class Quintin, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Andrea Bungaling Lecano, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Monica Camille Bacani Limpo, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Rowena Pangilinan Dakipil, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Christine Bautista Laguros, Foreign, Officer, Officer, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Cecile Joyce Yap Lau, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Luningning Kamuying Valdez, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Andre Peter Kabuay Estanislao, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Anwar Makatembel Ito, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Majela Christi Puwa Diezmos, Foreign Service, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Judy Boydon Razon, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Andrea Cristina Kaimo Kuamen, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Liza Maria Salazar Viejo, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Jonathan Andrew Dicinco Chua, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Florin Damesen Dakanay, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Janel John Santos Domingo, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Charles Charlson Carolino Hermosura, Foreign Services Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Noel Loreto Rodriguez, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. John Paul Tapia Samonte, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Anna Marie May Ramos Guerra, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Benjamin Aligado Celedio Jr., Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Elaine May Laruan Hernandez, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Stephanie Alexis Arejola Cruz, Foreign Services, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Milin Marqueses Acosta, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Von Ryan Gasmenya Pangwi, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. 
Marian Intal Bringas, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Mary Grace Luza Perpetua, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Mark Theodore Palacios Benigno, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Von Ryan Saltin Ferreira, Foreign, Officer, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. John Michael Bansil Gomez, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Miguel Carlo Narzo Hornilla, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Jacqueline Joan Santiago Arquisa, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Andrea Lynn Nicolás Lazaro, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Christian Sen Dicolin Cabahug, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. Jet Serra Olfato, Foreign Service Officer, Class 2. And there are nominations, additional jurisdictions. My Milen Garcia Albano, Non-Resident Ambassador to the Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Marshall Islands, in addition to being ex Ambassador Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary to Japan with the salary and emoluments of Chief of Mission Class 1. And Ambassador Jaime Victor Badillo Leda, Chief of Mission Class 1 as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Commission of the European Communities and the Council of the European Union, in addition to being Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Belgium, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Madam Secretary, please inform the Committee on the compliance of the jurisdictional requirements and other pertinent information regarding the nominations of and add in interim appointments under consideration. Mr. Chairperson, Your Honours, on various dates, your Secretariat received the nominations and ad interim appointments of the 61 Foreign Service officials under consideration. The nominees and appointees have each complied and submitted complete mandatory documentary requirements pursuant to Section 24, Chapter 6 of the New Rules of the Commission. Likewise, Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, the nominations and ad interim appointments under consideration, including the additional jurisdictions of Ambassador Albano and Ambassador Leda, were published on various dates in two newspapers of general circulation and broadcast over PTB4, pursuant to Section 2, Article 2 of the New Rules of the Standing Committees. Further, the nominations and ad interim appointments, including the additional jurisdictions of Ambassador Albano and Ambassador Leda, will be referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs by the Commission Chairperson and Senate President Juan Miguel Mix Zubiri, pursuant to Section 16, Chapter 5 of the New Rules of the Commission. The Commission Secretariat has not received any opposition on record against any of the nominees and appointees under consideration today. Furthermore, Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, also for the Committee's consideration are the additional foreign service jurisdictions of the following Chiefs of Mission, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary who have recently passed through the Commission. Ambassador Milen Garcia Albano, date of recent confirmation, September 21, 2020, current jurisdiction, Japan. Additional jurisdiction, non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Marshall Islands. Ambassador Jaime Victor B. Leda, date of recent confirmation, September 28, 2022, Kingdom of, current jurisdiction, Kingdom of Belgium, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Additional jurisdiction, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Commission of the European Communities and Council of the European Union. In several precedent cases like these in the past, Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, the Committee on Foreign Affairs granted the request of the DFA Secretary through the Department of Human Resources Management Office, HRMO, for the waiver of the submission of the mandatory documentary requirements and personal appearance of the concerned nominees. The reason being that they just went through the confirmation process and that they have been accepted already by the host country and have already begun performing their functions. The requests in the previous cases were likewise granted in line with the government's austerity measures and to ensure uninterrupted operations in the foreign mission. In this instant cases, Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, the DFA HRMO Assistant Secretary Christopher B. Montero have likewise requested for the same waiver and for the same reasons in the letters to the Committee Chairperson, Senator Jimmy Estrada, dated November 9 and 16, 2022. 
Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, the Secretariat is also in receipt of letter requests from Ambassador Manuel Antonio Javier Tihanki and Ms. Cecil Joyce Yatlao, both dated 28 November 2022, and a letter request from DFA HRMO Executive Director Mersole J. Melehor, dated December 1, 2022, requesting for the waiver of appearances of the Foreign Service officials who are at their station and performing official functions abroad. The request is in line with the government's austerity measure against and safety measures in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. These officials are, however, present online from their post abroad to respond to the inquiries of the committee members, namely Manuel Antonio Javier Tihanki, Enrico Trinidad Foss, Herminia V. Aguilar Usudan, Lolita Bugnot Capco, Leila Laura Santos, Susana Maria Lopez Mendiola, Shirley Liwanag Flores, Monica Camille Bacani Limpo, Ruena Pangilinan Dakipil, Andrea Bungaling Lecano, Luningning Kamoying Valdez, Christine Bautista Laguros, Jonathan Andrew D. Chinko Chua, Jonel John Santos Domingo, Noel Loreto Rodriguez, Christian Sen de Colen Cabajo, Jacqueline Joan Santiago Arquiza, John Michael Bansil Gomez, Jet Serra Olfato, Stephanie Alexis Arihola Cruz, Bon Ryan Saltin Ferreira, Andrea Lynn Nicolas Lazaro, Eileen May B. Laruan Hernandez, Cecil Joyce Yap Lau. Mr. Chairperson, Your Honors, these nominees and appointees are present online from their stations abroad in the Commission on Appointments video conferencing platform. That is all, Mr. Chairman, Your Honors. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Majority Leader. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that the letters dated this November 9 and 16, 2022 of DFA HRMO ASEC Christopher B. Montero requesting for the waiver to submit mandatory documents and the waiver of personal appearances of Ambassador Albano, the wife of Rodito, and Ambassador Leda for the reasons stated therein and as reported by Secretary Villarica, be approved. I so move, Mr. Chair. Are there any objections? There he hearing none, motion is approved. Likewise, Mr. Chairperson, I also move that the letters of Ambassador Tihanki and Ms. Lau, both dated November 28, 2022, and the letter of DFA HRMO Executive Director Mer Sole J. Melehor, dated December 1, 2022, Requesting for the waiver of personal appearances of foreign service officials for the reasons stated therein and as reported by Secretary Villarica be approved. I so move, Mr. Chair. Is there any objection? Hearing none, motion is approved. Madam Secretary, please administer the oath to all the nominees present and uh, together with all nominees present online too. All those present in person and those online, please stand and raise your right hands. And may we request those who are online to please open your microphone so that the committee will hear your responses. <laughs> Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this proceeding? So help you God. Mr. Chairman? Sumagot ba sila? Wala kami na rin. Online. Oh, yes, they are. I do. I do. Yes, I do. So yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Mr. Chairman, all the nominees and appointees are now under oath. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. May I call the most senior among the Foreign Service officials in this batch, the former Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Mr. Teodoro Lopez Luxin Jr. Please take the uh, designated seat in front. I think, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Mr. Ambassador. If not, no, Your Honor, I just await the pleasure of the of the Commission and I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have. Okay, the floor is open to any questions. Speak uh, uh, Senate President. I would just like to say for the record that this gentleman here has given us very years of dedicated service. We thank you for your service as Foreign Secretary and in your capacity as legislator and uh, other uh, posts in the Cabinet. And uh, it's an honor to have you represent us in the great uh, kingdom of Britain. And that's all, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to put that on record that uh, we're excited to have him as ambassador to the Court of St. James. Mr. 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 Chair, Majority Leader, 
Likewise, uh, a former member of Congress, former Secretary of DFA, highly qualified to be the ambassador of the UK. Uh, good friend, uh, Teddy Boy, I miss your tweets. I think you should do more. <laughs> it doesn't stop you from uh, uh, tweeting and uh, making our day most of the time. So congratulations. I think this is what, your third time to be in... Uh, Commission, first time when you were uh, ambassador to uh, the UN? Yes, yes. And secondly, as uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs? Yes, sir. And uh, third time, so third time. Third time. Press Secretary. Anyway, when, when the chair mentioned that you're the most senior, is that in rank or in age? <laughs> I, I suspect it's age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Congressman Pimentel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ambassador Ted Boy Luxin is a member, is a brother in the Fraternity of Free and Accepted Masons of the Philippines. So therefore, Mr. Chair, in behalf of all the brethren of the Free and Accepted Masons of the Philippines, we give our all-out support to Ambassador Ted Boy Luxin, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Congressman Pimentel. Senator Hontiveros, please. Salamat, Mr. Chair, at magandang hapon po kay Ambassador Loxin. If I may, Mr. Chair, I have uh, questions for uh, another of the uh, officials uh, before us today for uh, his confirmation. Um, WTO Permanent Representative Tihanki, please, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, I see him online, Mr. Chair. Um, magandang hapon din po, or... Excuse me, uh, before that, yes, do you have Mr. any questions so we can uh, uh, dispense with uh, Ambassador I apologize, Lofi. Mr. Chair, and to the good ambassador. I have no questions for okay. Ambassador Lopez. So any Sam other... Po. i just like to say also, put on record, that uh, this ambassador, he was Secretary of Foreign Affairs, did not allow our country to be bullied. I salute you, sir. And you always fought back when we had to. For our country, for nationalism, uh, he was a true patriot. You know, Paul. Mr. Chairman. So may we dispense with the good... Sec uh, Mr. Ambassador. Chairman. Just a short manifestation to Secretary Loxin, with your permission. Senator Caetano. I'd, I'd just like to... I want to say because I want to immediately, and as soon as I confirm that you can resume tweeting. Um, I'd just like to thank him. You know, continuity is such an important thing. And to many secretaries that... Uh, Parang yun na yung ultimate job eh, yung pagiging Secretary of Foreign Affairs that choose to relax, retire, enjoy, um, you know, their life. But uh, you accepted this task. So I, I just like to thank him kasi important yung continuity and together with, Sec, uh, Roma, with uh, Ambassador Romaldes and Secretary Manalo, the three can continue to work together and call each other and work out many, many issues that the country has to work out with our allies and with our new friends. So thank you for that, Secretary Luxin. Uh, if I may, um, I'd like to Please. thank uh, Senator Cayetano because he told President Duterte that, um, that I, I should be the one to take his place. I'm deeply grateful for that honor and that privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Luxin. Any other members who wish to ask questions? Okay, Ambassador Luxin, you are now excused. May we call on Ambassador uh, Jaime Adriano Flor Cruz? Please take the designated hot seat. Uh, first two question is uh, Senator Francis Tolentino. President, I have a few long questions. Uh, probably requiring short policy answers. And uh, my first question is not that long. How long have you been in China, sir? Uh, 48 years, sir. 48 years. 48 years in China. And I understand that President BBM will be, will be visiting China January 3? Yes, year. sir. Uh, January 3 to January 6. January 3 to January 6. First question is this. Uh, it has something to do with the U.S.-China relations yes, and how it will affect our country. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, Nikkei Asia interviewed Bilahari Sikan, 
Singapore's former Permanent Secretary of Foreign Service. I think you're familiar with this. Mr. Kausikan is of the opinion that sometime in 2008, 2008, China miscalculated the apparent decline and the inability to recover of America in particular and the West in general. Circumstances have shown that while America uh, experienced a, an economic slowdown and faced many challenges uh, up to this date, that the said slowdown is relative and not absolute. Mr. Kausikan further believes that the U.S. and China foreign relations are more complicated than the post-World War II Cold War between the U.S. and the then USSR. This is because China, U.S. and China are not competing systems, but are in fact vital parts of a single system. They are connected to each other and to Japan and to Singapore and to Europe and to everybody because of supply, chain, supply chains of a complexity and scope that is historically unprecedented. And I'm quoting his interview made last October 12, 2022. The, the, the title is, Since China has made three foreign policy mistakes. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, given that closely or intertwined economic positions of China and the U.S. and their respective relations with the Philippines, how will this impact China-Philippine relations? This is academic, and if so, in what manner? Given your 48 years of presidential stint in the People's Republic of China. You may answer, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Chair, Your Honors, um, it's a very complex uh, question. You, you're right. Um, I don't think China uh, has miscalculated the United States. I believe China still considers the United States as a formidable uh, power in the world. Uh, but yes, uh, the two are in a rivalry, uh, locked in rivalry on many fronts. Um, I do not believe that the U.S. is behind uh, or is lagging behind China, although China has made huge uh, strides on many fronts, space power, cybersecurity, uh, you name it, innovation, Artificial China intelligence. is, is oh. going up there. So I think for the Philippines, we need to uh, be aware of the growing rivalry between the two powers, China rising and the United States as the status quo power. And uh, we do not want to be the grass um, trampled upon by the two uh, elephants who are are uh, in the process of uh, a rivalry right now. I, I believe that um, we should continue our engagement with China. We should pursue the independent policy that uh, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, elaborated, saying that in the community of countries, we should remain, continue to be friends for all and enemy of none. That was a longer answer than I Sorry, expected, sir. but that's good. Uh, it was an academic question. My second question, Mr. Ambassador, is that foreign analysts noted with some concern, and I think you're familiar, familiar with this because you've been in China for the last 48 years, that President Xi Jinping emerged from the October 2022 Chinese Communist Party's Congress in Beijing with an increased grip on power manifested by appointing his quote-unquote, loyalists to the Politburo Standing Committee as well as to the broader government leadership. Uh, we're still, we can still vividly recall that uh, the former president was physically removed from his seat and uh, shown his way out. This had an economic impact for China. One, the housing market suffered after President Xi Jinping sought to curb speculation, prompting dozens of real estate developers to default on their debts. Number two, the stringent approach of imposing massive lockdowns, although it's being eased now, and quarantines against COVID-19 outbreaks throttled consumer spending on everything from cheap eateries, yung mga karinderia nila, to high-end jewelry. Number three, entrepreneurs have fled the country. This is uh, recorded. Fearing regulatory crackdowns and the possibility of higher taxes on the part of President Xi Jinping's pledge to deliver, quote unquote, common prosperity. Number four, extensive restriction 
on tech and online education sectors contributed to the widespread unemployment among Chinese under the age of 25. Tatagalugin ko po yung tanong. Given this widely uh, accepted uh, principle that we believe, democ democ democracy po tayo, ano po makakatulong sa ating bansa? Yung mga nangyayari sa People's Republic of China, although we don't want that uh, to happen. And as an ambassador, uh, how would you how would you lend your voice as the representative of the country to encourage the Chinese government to continue that easing up, to continue that uh, easing up of lockdowns, not just in China, but even in Hong Kong? You have the floor, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Um, in the first place, Paul, let's imagine the position of President Xi Jinping. He's presiding over 1.4 billion people in such a wide uh, swath of land. So he's also he's dealing with a lot of problems at the same time. Many of the problems were new, are new. Many of the, some of the problems were inherited over the years. Uh, for example, the housing bubble. It's not just during his time when the housing bubble uh, grew and, and emerged as it is now. So I believe, sir, that the COVID policy that they pursued in the past two and a half years were driven by the worry, the concern of death, uh, of minimizing death. And in, to a certain extent, they're right. Right. They are one of the few countries which kept the death due to COVID to uh, uh, the minimum. Uh, at, however, it has cost China. If I may interrupt, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Are you referring to death, D E B T, or death, D E no. A T H? D E A T H, Paul. Um, so, in, in, in that sense, Paul, China is right in, in pursuing that uh, policy. However, I think they've reached the point where the economic cost and the cost on ordinary people in their lives has grown and has become destabilizing. In China, Paul, uh, because of their, uh, the enormity of the problems, um, they, their primordial concern is social stability. Social stability trumps everything. Um, and that is why you, we will see China's policies here and there would sometimes appear to us as uh, draconian, but um, these are all driven by the internal uh, uh, factors. Uh, and so in, in my situation, sir, I would, I would um, encourage our friends in China to um, pursue a, a gradual calibrated reopening of of their COVID policy, which I think is already happening. I think it has begun, and I hope that by the time President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. visits Beijing, we will reach a, a new normal, meaning uh, less quarantine, uh, no lockdowns, and, and a, a better, a more normal kind of life among, for the Chinese as well. Thank you. Malapit na yan, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, I know, sir. Uh, uh, one last question, and this will have multiple answers of uh, great consequence. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, last month, uh, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris was here. Uh, Vice President Harris denounced China for its action in relation to the disputed waters of the West Philippine Sea. She promised that the United States would stand by the Philippines she made her remarks to members of the Philippine Coast Guard in Palawan. I think you're aware of that. Yes, sir. Uh, although all of us here would always view with grave concern the artificial islands that your host country continues to maintain and fortify in the contested areas and the continued harassment of our fishing vessels and native ships, ships are fishermen, fisher folks, and in addition to this, last month, likewise, Vice Admiral Albert Carlos of the Philippine Navy reported the encounter between the Philippine, Philippine and Chinese ships in the Spratlys over debris that our officials believe was part of a Chinese rocket. Coast Guard report 
the, the Chinese Coast Guard reportedly blocked our vessels twice, the path twice, and forcefully retrieved the debris, cutting the rope that was being used to tow it. I'm, I'm quoting a report uh, from a, a news report coming from the New York Times. Mr. Ambassador, how long? How, you, your term is for six years. How long do we expect a repetition of our continuing diplomatic actions, protests, protests? We're nearing, we're hovering the, the sold of 200 protests. I don't know how many protests do we file every day. How long, how, how long can we have this diplomatic patience and tolerance? And how would your post effectively, effectively reduce not just the tension, improve the relations, especially as we explore joint, uh, joint uh, explorations? How long do you think this continuing pattern would last? And how will you, as an ambassador to China, help intervene, having lived there for 48 years, and encourage members of the Politburo, I'm sure you've met some of them, to address an out of, uh, uh, reach an out-of-the-box solution that perhaps would embody all our ideals as reflected in that arbitral ruling and the aspirations of our fishermen to freely fish in that area. Hanggang kailan po ito, Mr. Ambassador? I, I, I know, hindi mo, uh, this is beyond your paycheck, but can you give a, an answer as a Filipino who has lived there and aware of the sentiments of the Filipino people? Um, your Honors, um, if I ans if I if you wish me to answer it as a Filipino, I wish it will stop today. I I wish it will not happen again, and I wish uh, that we will be respected as a nation. Our sovereignty will be respected. However, I do not have the magic wand. Uh, I can we cannot just wish it away. Uh, the problem faces us, and what we can do, I believe, is. I believe foreign policy begins at home. We, I think, need to be united, the executive, legislative, Supreme Court. We should be united as a nation. And I had a chance to actually talk personally with Admi Vice Admiral Carlos a few days ago. And I realized the, uh, the predicament that they face every day, trolling our seas. I believe that our foreign policy should be based on strength, which means that we should uh, ensure that our armed forces, especially our Coast Guards, our Navy, are well-funded, well-trained, uh, because I believe that's, that's the best uh, way to assert our sovereign rights, our territorial rights. Of course, it's easier said than done. But um, I, I believe that unity, national unity, should be the predicate of our foreign policy. Mr. Chairman, I, I have other questions, but I would uh, give other members of this committee a chance to propound their questions. Thank you. I sir. do not question the uh, patriotism of the nominee. He's still a Filipino, although he has lived in China for 48 years. I wish him well. I wish that he can likewise speed up uh, the resolutions of continuing daily grievances of our fisher folk and the continuing sentiments of our countrymen that we really own that land, that area. Yes, it has to be expressed over and over again. Yes, Pilipinas po yan. Yes, Hindi po pag ng People's Republic of China. And I hope you will do that. Express I will do that. that daily. Put up a tarpaulin outside the premises of your embassy. Can you do that? Get out of the West Philippine Sea. Kaya po yun? Get out of the West Philippine Sea, even in Chinese characters. 
You're nodding your head in meaning to say you're going to do that? I will consider it, sir. You will consider. You will consider. I, 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 I believe that the nominee, uh, Mr. Chairman, is qualified. We just hope that uh, the events that will un unfold next year will be to the greater interest of our country. Thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Tolentino, Senator President. Marami Salamat, Ambassador uh, Flor Cruz. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, advance congratulations to you, sir. Thank you, Paul. But, you know, the position that you will be sitting in as Ambassador of the Philippines to the People's Republic of China is one of the very sensitive position, and sensitive because we are having, uh, I'd say, daily intrusions by our big uh, neighbor from the north in our particular area of the West Philippine Sea. But before I raise that, Ambassador, you have been in China for since the 1970s. I read your bio data. 71, Paul. 1971. Did you have to change your citizenship no. from Filipino to Chinese? Never. I, I did not have to, and I never did, sir. So what was the, how were you able to stay there for that long? You took up a, a working visa? Is it a student's uh, visa and then a working Initially, visa? Paul, I was a tourist. Then I became a sta stateless citizen for a few years. And then when I was employed by uh, a magazine, I, I was there uh, with a journalist visa. And from then on, it was as a journalist uh, covering China. So, you know, there's a syndrome that they call in uh, law enforcement, the Helsinki syndrome, is when, or Stockholm rather, Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome, syndrome, wherein uh, if you are kidnapped for a long, long time, or you'll get influenced by your kidnappers. In this case, maybe be assured that your 40 year stint in China will not in any way uh, be disadvantageous to the Republic of the Philippines, and you'll always remain faithful and loyal to your motherland. You can be assured, Paul, that uh, in my in my vein, in my mind, in my heart, I'm a Filipino through and through, and I never uh, thought anything else except being a Filipino. And I've proudly waved the flag of the Philippines in China. And I don't, uh, and I will not uh, doubt it because you're a graduate of PUP. Yes, sir. And PUP students are patriotic students. Very, very of, um, patriotic. nationalistic. Uh, Students are from uh, the Philippine uh, University of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Yes, sir. The reason I raise this, and I want to follow the line of questioning of our distinguished colleague from Cavite, is that nine hours ago, reported by the Inquirer, dozens of Chinese vessels believed to be manned by their maritime militias in the West Philippine Sea have been moving closer and closer to the island of Palawan. It was confirmed by Vice Admiral uh, Carlos Carlos uh, today that it is true yes. that they are coming closer and closer to our shores. We will be and and following the footsteps of our former DFA Secretary Secretary Teddy Boy Luxin, who would first tweet it na mga with a colorful statement <laughs> and then follow up with a note verbal to the uh, uh, Chinese embassy. Will we be able to get that assurance also that in China, when you're representing us there, that you will be uh, moving uh, heaven and earth uh, and letting them know our position with these intrusions, these illegal intrusions into our territory? As the incoming uh, ambassador to China, my goal is to serve as a bridge between our two governments, and that means uh, relaying accurately, clearly, and promptly the message that we have to to to, um, to give to the other side, especially in cases like what you just cited. Um, it comes in the form of um, not not verbal, and we we may think not verbal are useless. Protests are useless, but I am told, sir, that they are important because. Whenever we make our diplomatic protests, they become on the record, part of the uh, legal record, and so that when we have to make a claim or a case against a country, they will be the legal basis. All these diplomatic protests are recorded and will become the legal basis of our case in case we wish to lodge. So my goal, sir, is um, to make sure that the message is uh, is relayed clearly, firmly, 
And of course, uh, with the upcoming visit of our president, I think this is the best time for the two sides to have a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, face-to-face uh, dialogue, conversation on issues like this. Um, this is the best way, sir, uh, just as we have done in the past. And that's why the appointment of this good gentleman should not be delayed further, because I believe they're coming, the president's going to be coming over to China, or going over to China on January. You said the key word, Mr. Chairman, he said the key word, which is firmly, please be firm, Ambassador. Yes, sir. We can't lose, you know, we had, we hosted here the president of the, the parliament of Vietnam, and one thing that I have to salute Vietnam with is they don't allow themselves to be bullied yes, by sir. anyone, whether it's the French, the American, the Chinese, and, and the Russians. So I hope that we can have that same policy, friend to all, but firm with our, our territorial waters, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador. We will so advise that's all, that. Sir. Yeah, that's the, that, is the, um, that is the advice we'd like to give you. That is the sense of the Senate and uh, this body, the CA is that please protect our territorial integrity when you are there representing us in China. We will be salamat. I'm salamat, Ambassador. Thank President, uh, Senator Rontiveros. Salamat, Mr. Chairman. Magandang hapon po, Ambassador. Magandang hapon po. Um, Ambassador, according to your profile, and as you have narrated to the committee, you studied, worked, and traveled in China for more than 40 years, almost half a century, and reported extensively on the country as a journalist since 1980. You're also considered the dean of the Foreign Press Corps in Beijing, being the longest-serving foreign correspondent in China to date, as well as one of the world's most respected China watchers. You also hold a degree in Chinese history from Peking University. Interestingly, you were also known as a vocal opponent of a previous regime during your college days, during which you found yourself stranded in China. After the then president suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and uh, rounded up hundreds of his opponents and critics, some might say it's ironic, but, or that, having been in effect exiled by the father, you have now accepted an appointment under the sun. What are your thoughts and feelings about that, Ambassador? Uh, Mr. Chair, there are reasons for everything. And um, I went to China because I love the Philippines, because I wanted to serve the Philippines. I stayed in China for the same reason, and I'm taking up this position, this nomination, for the same reason, which is to serve the country. I am very privileged to be uh, of public service. I've never served in a public position in the Philippines. And so I am very honored and privileged to take this up again to serve the country. Thank you, Ambassador, Mr. Chairman. Well, who can argue with love? So now to a few policy questions Please. Um, that uh, the committee trusts you will answer this afternoon and in your work in the years ahead, based on that same uh, spirit of love. To follow up the earlier questions posed by my colleagues on stability in the region, so given the depth of your knowledge of the political situation in China, how do you think we can engage meaningfully with, well, progressives and any moderates within the Chinese government to ensure stability in the region and arrive at a fair and equitable settlement vis-a-vis -vis our territorial disputes in the West Philippine and South China Seas? Um, I believe that China change will change because it's there in, in their interest, not because we told them, not because anyone tells them or lectures them. Um, I think that um, we've seen that in Chinese history, that the Chinese are a very proud nation. Uh, they, are, they have a long civilization and they will evolve um, in, in, in the way that is good for themselves. Um, and so I believe that we as a neighbor uh, should uh, engage with China. Um, we should uh, wish them well whenever they are doing well, uh, because I think a stable China is good for the Philippines. The worst case scenario for the Philippines 
is when China gets into a chaotic period, which we have seen before. Um, so in that sense, I believe that we should encourage the positive moves that China makes. In my uh, role as the ambassador in China, I would like to promote people-to-people uh, relations. I believe uh, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in a speech uh, a month or so ago made this point of the importance of people-to-people -people, uh, relations. And I believe that's my strength because I know China very well. I have a lot of friends in China. And I think that if we can promote cultural sports technological, uh, and of course, trade, economic trade relations, we can have more stake, and the China and China will have more stake in this bilateral relations. So I, I, I wish to um, pursue that uh, on the ground, and of course, uh, for the uh, bilateral relations, I wish we can promote more uh, exchanges for engagement on fisheries, uh, on renewable energy, on connectivity, which are the current government's uh, uh, priority uh, in, in their agenda. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I hope that uh, the good ambassadors, hopeful or even optimistic scenario that China will change uh, actually has a possibility of materializing, especially in the context of what has been written about their great rejuvenation project yes. leading up to their centennial in 2049. Um, I, I share the ambassador's concerns about possible exchanges in fisheries, renewable energy, connectivity, etc. But of course, it would seem that the number one priority of China is really its uh, defense and security uh, development internally and projection globally. So we'll really have to see how uh, we fit into that and more than seeing how we fit into that, yes. as my colleagues have already shared with the good ambassador, really assert uh, our place in the world, even if China still doesn't imagine us in the way that we imagine ourselves. Um, last uh, question for this topic. Uh, it's probably related, Ambassador, if you would just care to add anything uh, to this. How do we traverse the emergence of China as a global superpower and a near-peer threat to the U.S. and the rest of the West? I believe that um, by pursuing an independent foreign policy, we, we, we make this delicate balance between the two, uh, the two powers, the two superpowers, China, the rising power, and the United States, the status quo power. I know it's not easy, it's a delicate balance. I believe that we are already beginning to do that by uh, at the same time promoting uh, or uh, strengthening relations with the U.S. Uh, our president is going to China for the same kind of reason, which is to balance our relations. Um, we are... Um, we are near China, we are big neighbor China, and so there are many good reasons to uh, make sure that we have good relations with our neighbor. It does not mean that we will abandon uh, our arbitral ruling award. Uh, it does not mean that we will sacrifice our sovereign and territorial rights, but we just want to have a good neighborly relations with China, the same way that we also wish to have good relations with the United States. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, Mr. Chairman, especially for the good ambassador's affirmation that we will not, and I hope ever, abandon our arbitral ruling. And with that as an essential building block, seek and build and be an honest broker in building good neighborly relations with everyone on the basis of mutual respect. So just for my last question for this afternoon, Ambassador, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's also related to a question raised by a, a colleague earlier. China has recently experienced problems in its real estate sector, with home buyers refusing to honor their mortgages. COVID restrictions have also caused widespread unrest in the country. 
So could you, uh, Ambassador, please provide this committee, this commission, with an update vis-a-vis -vis recent political and economic developments in China? And lastly, recommendations as to how the Philippines can best navigate the geopolitical fallout of these events. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, China is confronting many problems that you just uh, mentioned, uh, a housing bubble, uh, a COVID restriction, lockdowns that has caused uh, enormous um, economic loss as well as disruptions in the people's lives. Um, but I think we need to watch how China uh, address those, those questions. It's a challenge to China's ability to uh, adapt to uh, this new situation. I believe that they have already begun to loosen up their restrictions on, uh, regarding COVID. Uh, in many big cities, they have already uh, abandoned the uh, uh, lockdowns or the uh, requirements for uh, repeated tests. Um, but again, China is big. And, and so it will only be a gradual uh, resolution of those problems. The housing problem is the same. They wish to deflate the bubble uh, gradually to avoid the collapse of, of uh, the economy. But again, um, China has achieved a lot. And side by side with their achievements stand the huge challenges that they face and that's what we are seeing right now. Um, and it's a big challenge to the government. Um, the question is, will they be result driven? Will they be pragmatic enough to, um, to address those problems uh, in a way that are not disruptive uh, to their lives, but also to the lives of their neighbors like the Philippines? How do we um, place ourselves? Um, I believe that, again, uh, constant engagement with China, uh, both on the ground level, people-to-people -people level, as well as the, the top level between our presidents, uh, between our top leaders. I think those are essential uh, tools. And as journalists, I think we will do our best to use all the diplomatic tools uh, that we can to manage our very complex relations with China uh, so that we we can avoid any miscalculations, misunderstandings, and accidents. I think that's our that should be our immediate goal, uh, and that supposes a, a good understanding between the two sides. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Chairman. Of course, a good understanding, but always also mutual respect. It's uh, easier for a smaller. Um, person or country to respect a bigger one. It's a bit more difficult uh, in the opposite direction, as we also experience with China. I appreciate, interestante po sinabi nyo, will China be pragmatic and not disruptive? Eh, sa ating mga asyano, we prize pragmatism also. Uh, but it, in the meantime, China has become a lot more powerful and rich, as you know better than me. And so she maybe feels that she can afford to be more ideological or really, really aggressively push her vision, even vis-a-vis -vis countries outside her border. I only wish na yung sinabi nyo po, Ambassador, about China loosening up, for example, on COVID restrictions and maybe some other things would extend to uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, yes. let alone the Philippines, but... Uh, maybe that's a little too much to wish for right now. And hindi ko naman po itatanong sa inyo, pero just to share more of the questions in the minds of us Filipinos as you uh, take up your post to represent our country uh, in Beijing. So maraming salamat po salamat sa inyo po. and best uh, uh, wishes. Uh, Thank you. Po kayo. Salamat, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Sam Teresa. Next in line is the Congressman Padiernos. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is not a question, but a comment. I would like to manifest my general support uh, to the confirmation of the ad interim appointments of all the DFA nominees. And I also want to thank all our DFA nominees for their service to and sacrifice to our country. But please allow me to mention my strong support specifically to my uh, neighbor, Ambassador Teddy Boy Loxin, 
my compadre, uh, also to the daughter of former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, uh, Ambassador Evangelina Lourdes Arroyo Bernas, and to my kababayan from uh, uh, Cabiao Nueva Ecija, in service officer Andrea Cristina Caimo Kaohanem, siya ay pinagpamalaki ng aming mga kababayan na Novo Isihanos naway ipagpatuloy niya ang kanyang mabuting paninilbihan sa ating bansa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Congressman Padianos. Congress uh, Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my question to the Ambassador basically is, you know, when you talk about Philippine-China relations, <laughs> The dispute, territorial dispute, always comes into mind. So my, my question basically is, can we grow the relationship beyond the territorial dispute? Or is it a precursor to any type of uh, relationship, whether trade, tourism, sports, and cultural exchanges? Is it a precursor? Um, Your Honors, I think the President, uh, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. already said that our territorial dispute with China is not the sum total of our relations. And that means that we, while we insist on our sovereign rights and territorial rights, we can promote um, bilateral relations and ties on many fronts, um, including economic, uh, trade, tourism, as you mentioned, uh, fisheries, and renewable energies. Just a few days ago, sir, um, I put together our Department of, of Energy with a Chinese company, which is interested to invest um, in renewable energy in the Philippines. So I think this is one, one you know, example of the potential that uh, the two uh, countries' relations uh, offer to our to our own benefit. Um, these are just one, but there are many others. But you know, aspirations in words are different from reality. For example, in terms of trade, can you safely say that trade between the Philippines and China has increased basically for as China um, Chinese investments pledges have they increased the past? Um, two, three years compared to, you know, before the intensity of the dispute, uh, tourism. Yes. I, I feel the tourism numbers has decreased even, has by, even prior to COVID numbers. Uh, in fact, I will get into my next question regarding the real, uh, but, you know, aspirations and uh, pronouncements are different from reality. Is that correct? Um, as of uh, early this year, sir, China remains our number one trade um, or economic partner. It's also the number two uh, uh, source of um, of imports, and um, also our exports. Uh, is it, China is also uh, an export destination. It's our number seventh, uh, our seventh uh, biggest investor, foreign investment, uh, as of. As, as of early this year. So the potential is there. Of course, um, tourism was impacted by the pandemic because China has uh, imposed lockdowns. So many Chinese who used to come here have been unable to visit the Philippines as tourists. But I believe that if China opens up again, uh, tourism will be uh, Will, is bound to grow again, and um, the potential is uh, is huge. So, based on your statements that China is a major trading partner and the territorial dispute isn't that intertwined or linked? Um, that's that we what, cannot, but we cannot totally contra, I mean, you know, counter their their claims because at the back of our minds, they are a major trading partner. Is that I mean? Uh, it is uh, a consideration, uh, Your Honor, um, and what we are trying to um, pursue is that while we um, have, while we um, deal with territorial and sovereign issues with China, we also are pursuing uh, other fronts, uh, engagement and partnerships, because I think these uh, are intertwined uh, and. The more relations we have, the better our bilateral ties will be. 
So anyway, my my colleague is telling me uh, some. Uh, yeah, last na lang no, uh, Abicolano no. We're, it's Thanks. always been our aspiration, dream that the Manila South Rail, Manila Rail, will push through. Yes. And unfortunately, all presidents have pronounced that they will finish the rail. And once they win, they try to do it. Even the President Duterte was pushing for it, but unfortunately, after six years, uh, not even a groundbreak started. And now there's a problem with the. Uh, interest rates, if I'm not mistaken. So what will you do, uh, Mr. Ambassador, to will you bargain to, for a better interest rate? Or do we just shut the shut down and look for other countries to finance this? Uh, Your Honors, I, th I believe that we should um, revive the idea. We should uh, leave it to our experts first to uh, re negotiate the details of of the uh, project. I believe it's a very good project and whoever takes up the project uh, is bound to benefit. It will, it's, it will benefit our people in your district, but also the whole country. So my wish is uh, that we can use all the uh, channels open to us, including the, you know, the top leadership uh, our leadership and their leadership, so that we can revive the uh, the project as it should be. Yes, uh, we hope sure. and pray that you keep that in mind when you're in office, uh, when you're in China. No, please. Uh, lastly, uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, just briefly, as ambassador to China, what will you do that the, your predecessor did not do as ambassador? My predecessor did a very good job. I understand, yes. yes. But what will you do? I mean, if you're just going to do what he did, that, that would be good. But, you know, uh, he's an ex he was an excellent ambassador. I will, a lot of emphasis on people-to-people -people, uh, relations. Uh, our relations on the ground, I will uh, encourage more Filipinos to learn China, Chinese, and Chinese to learn about the Philippines, because I believe that will help uh, facilitate a better relations. Uh, anyway, uh, we wish you all the best. We're running out of time, and we wish we we pray that uh, with the present visit China, uh, it will be a success. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You, sir. Thank I, you. I, I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. that uh, Senator Marcoleta, uh, there's still one more uh, member wishes to ask questions. But just a reminder, we do have Senate sessions. There's only three days left. We have we have legislation we'd like to pass. Let's keep it brief, my dear colleagues, please or else uh, we're going to have an uprising here in the Senate. At 3 o'clock is our session, so we're now at 4 o'clock. We still have plenary for all of them. There's four cabinet, uh, three cabinet posts and all these gentlemen and ladies that we have to take up in plenary. Uh, just a gentle reminder to my colleagues. Uh, thank you. I know it's a time of Kong Marcoleta. Just 30 seconds, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Ligarda. Uh, I'm not asking any questions among any foreign service official and the ambassadors. I just wanted to manifest my 101% support for Ambassador Jaime Flor Cruz, uh, former Secretary Ambassador um, Teddy Loxin, and Ambassador Luli uh, Arroyo, and all others. And uh, I will not ask any more questions because they're very, very competent and they know their job. And I just wanted to recommend them already to the plenary so that they can get on with their work. Uh, of course, I respect the right of all the members to ask questions. Okay, but uh, that, I wanted to give my f wholehearted support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Ligara. You. Senator Bongo? Uh, as Vice Chairman of this uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, full um, support po ako. Brief lang po ito. Support kay uh, Ambassador uh, Jaime Flor Cruz. And of course, kay uh, Ambassador uh, Luxin. Sir, pag nandun ka na, pansinin mo kami ha. Pakita ka sa amin. Bibiro ka kami ni Secretary uh, Senator Alan kanina. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Ambassador Luli uh, Arroyo, Ambassador uh, Austria, Ambassador Tihanki, uh, Monica Kimpo, lahat. Full support sa lahat. Sabi ni, sabi ni SP, include... Pag naging ambasador na rin si SP, uh, wag niyong kalimutan. <laughs> Salamat po. Basta full support po kami sa inyo. Unahin niyo lang po yung kapakanan ng ating mga 
kababayan, lalong-lalo na po yung mga OFWs po. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Sir Terbongo. Congressman Marcoleta. Last but not the least. Last but not the least. Maraming salamat, Mr. Brief. Chair. Oh, oh. How many questions do you want to take? One only. <laughs> but you have to ask, you have to answer yes kung yes lang and no. And para hindi tayo humapa. You do not need a magic wand. What you need is a formula which was already articulated by Secretary Manalo. The only question is that he failed to understand where to start. Ang sabi niya doon sa 6th anniversary on the award of South China Sea Arbitration, sabi niya, the award on the South China Sea Arbitration and UNCLOS are the twin anchors of the Philippine policy and actions on the West Philippine Sea. This is correct. Ang problema po, hindi niya alam po paano niya sisimulan. I will tell you, why UNCLOS? You can take advantage of, of Article 123 of the UNCLOS. Because Article 123 describes the South China Sea as a semi-enclosed sea. And I'm telling Secretary Manalo, what is the significance of that? Kasi po, yung semi-enclosed sea, sinasabi doon, the coastal states will have to coordinate and cooperate in the exploration, conservation, development, etc., etc., of this uh, of the enclosed sea. Doon tayo magsimula, and China will understand that because it is in the UNCLOS. Do not, do not make any engagement yes. that will relate to territory. China is very sensitive about territory. That one will not involve territory. You understand, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Ang sabi niya, the South China Sea, the South China Sea arbitration is only a declaration. It did not say anything. The South China Sea Award, kailangan po ipaliwanag ninyo sa ating mga kababayan. This is where the failure of communication is. Ang buong akala nila, nagkakagulo tayo because they do not understand why. Imagine yourself in the middle of a circle. Yung circle po na yan, Mr. Chair, South China Sea. is the, no, 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 the South China Sea Ito yung kabuuan. Mm -hmm. Pero yung maliit na circle doon, ano yung sinasabi nating exclusive economic sea, mm -hmm. exclusive economic zone. Doon po sa loob ng exclusive economic zone, meron pong ino-occupy na islands in China. Mm -hmm. Under the UNCLOS, pagka yung ino-occupy is an island, that island is entitled to a territorial sea, ito it is also entitled to its own economic zone. Right. Nagkataon po, Yung island na yon nandun sa economic zone ng Philippines. Mm -hmm. Sa mga tuwid, mayroong island ng, ng China doon. Palagay mong isa lang. Kung nandun yung China, doon sa island na yun, because it is occupying that island, it enjoys the territorial sea, which is 12 miles from the baseline. It enjoys also its entitlement on its own economic zone. So makikita mo doon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary, mag-overlap yung dalawa. Kaya yung... yung, yung Barko ng China, nandun sa territorial sea ng island na yon, pero nandun sa ating economic sea, nagkakagulo tayo. Why? Wala pong world court ngayon, Mr. Secretary, that will arbitrate kung sino may ari, kung sino po ang occupant under public international law is the owner. Kailangan po i-distinguish nyo ang national law and international law. Sa national law natin, you are in possession but you are not the owner. In international law, if you are the possessor, ikaw ang owner. Sinabi ba ng arbitral award, China, you have to vacate those islands? Depot. No, sir. No, sir. The arbitral award, Mr. Secretary, did not say anything, did not order China to do anything. Right. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Oh, correct. Kailangan po ipaliwanag niyo. Kasi pag nandun siya sa kanyang territorial sea, kasi po ang hindi masyadong nalalaman, Mr. Chairman, China occupies about 14 islands particularly in this Pratt list. Vietnam occupies 22, correct? Yes, sir. But China is more aggressive because it has more logistics. Yeah. Tayo siguro anim lang, Malaysia 4, and Taiwan 1. You are a Bachelor of Arts in Chinese History. The two of you moars nakita ninyo, China is very sensitive kasi palagi silang ina-attack ina through the sea. Kaya ngayon, masyado silang mahigpit dyan. Right. Pero, when you study Chinese history, China did not conquer any country. 
in its entire history. Right. From Ming Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, and all this. Nag-occupy na ba siya? Nag-invade ba siya ng country kahit isa? Hindi po. I mean, Hindi. Nag-invade siya. Ang nag-invade siya pa. Yeah. Okay. Great Britain. Mm-hmm. Where our colleague, uh, Teddy Boy Loxin, is supposed to be the ambassador. United States. Yung mga yan eh. Oh. Pero China hindi po nag-invade. Kailangan maintindihan po natin. Oh. So, yun po yung da- gusto nating ipaliwanag. Mm-hmm. Hindi po niya binabiolate yung ating economic zone kasi meron din siyang economic zone which is an ent- entitlement under public international law. Pero, ito po yung gagawin natin. Sinabi po dun sa award, ito yung dapat yung gamitin. Kung binasa po ninyo yung arbitral award, refer to paragraph 805. Ano sabi ko na sa iyo? 805 and 806. Okay. What did the arbitral award say? Sabi niya, yung Scarborough Shoal is a traditional fishing ground. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Share. Magsishare po tayo doon. China, China will understand the traditional fishing right because it is a settled norm in public international law. It does not involve territory. So, ba't hindi po tayo magsimula doon? Mr. Chair, ito po yung gusto kong i-share sa kanila. If you start with the traditional fishing ground, maiintindihan ng China because we do not we do not tackle the issue of territory. And then you have to remember, kasi po dito nagkakagulo yung DFA, ang exclusive economic zone and territorial sea is not of our territory. You have to understand that under public international law. So ito pong media kasi kung isang ginugulo. Ah, ini-invade ang ating... Hindi po, yung, yung ating 12-mile territorial sea and the exclusive economic zone is not part of Philippine territory. Maliwanag po. Apa, apa. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Salamat. Thank you, uh, Congressman Marquiletta. Thank you, Congressman Marquiletta. Thank you, Congressman Marquiletta. Thank you, Congressman There are missing cases. Here, the Federal Republic of Germany. Here's Iceland. Mr. Mr. Chair, I move that all the nominees uh, be yeah. under the still. Fishing right. For that, Senator Ligarda. Senator Risa. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Just a brief manifestation for the consideration of the good ambassador. Yung isa pong pinaka pinangahawakan ko po sa sinabi ninyo ngayong araw ay yung we will not abandon the arbitral ruling. Sabi po ninyo, bilang journalist, bilang ambassador natin, you will use all diplomatic means to advance our interest and to build good neighborly relations with the country where you will be based. Yes, ma'am. Yung um, panalo po natin sa Hague Tribunal is a prize. It's a crown jewel of a diplomatic means. Dahil di ba, sinab, tinuro po sa ating lahat na diplomacy is the continuation of war by other means. Yes. We cannot and we never want to win anything from any country, let alone China, by war. Yes. Pero yung panalo po natin sa Hague ruling, which invalidated the nine-dash line claim of China to our exclusive economic zone, invalidates yung kanyang mga unfriendly neighborly actions against our people already enumerated by the colleagues. So yun lamang po, Mr. Chairman, good ambassador, I just wish to affirm what the ambassador said earlier. Nahahawakan po ng maraming Pilipino po yan, hindi lamang ako. Salamat po. Salamat po. Thank you, uh, Senator Monteveros, uh, Congressman Pimentel. Uh, Mr. Chair, manifestation. I just like to manifest my support to the ante- ad interim appointment of Luning Ning Kamuying Valdez. She's very much uh, qualified for the post. She topped the Foreign Service exam in 2010. She was a liaison officer of Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. And I'm very sure that she'll be a, an asset in the DFA. She's a very dedicated Foreign Service officer, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Guico, for a brief manifestation. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is not a question. I would like to make a manifestation of support to 
Evangeline Lourdes Arroyo Verdas, uh, the daughter of uh, President Gloria Magapagal Arroyo, and uh, also uh, because I am related to her. Uh, yes. <laughs> She's my pamangkin. Uh, okay. Before Senator Alan uh, Caetano, you, Mr. Chairman, if I may, yeah, like also manifest uh, my full support to all, of course, the ambassadors and career service officials here, but most especially is Ambassador Leda there. Ambassador Leda. Yes. Please stand. Uh, we'd like to thank you for your support when we led the mission to the EU. We did, you did a wonderful job hosting the legislators. We did the advanced team for the president, because I know the president is leaving on the 16th. Uh, we were able to do a good job in at least relaying a good, uh, uh, at least good uh, uh, friendship and relationship with the EU in the Philippine Parliament. So, Madam Salamat Ambassador. Last minute, kaya ka magaling yan. Senator Cayetano. Sir Chairman, a quick manifestation and one quick question kay Nomini Arroyo. Can she take the seat while uh, I just make a manifestation? Mr. Mr. Okay. Chair, I'd just like to clarify because the nominee who I support, and I think it is a good way also of uh, our former Chinese, uh, our former ambassador to China, Chito Santa Romana, to have uh, someone like our nominee here. Uh, Chito did so much for the country. But I just like to clarify, ha, the march or yung uh, protest, hindi to katulad sa local law, hindi ka nag-protest, eh, magkakaroon ng latches o kaya waiver. No, hindi yun ang purpose ng diplomatic protest. There are political and other purposes for a protest, but it doesn't mean pag hindi ka parati na protest mawawala iyong uh, right dun sa pinaglalaban mo. An example is, yung tinanong ko sa DFA, ilang beses tayo nag-protest sa Vietnam at Malaysia na mas maraming features na binildan so sa China sa EEZ ng Pilipinas, ilang beses tayo nag-protest. They did not protest. So that does not mean na hindi natin klineclaim at wala tayong claim. But if they do protest, just like when Secretary Luxin protest, we support that because there are specific process during that time as well as sometimes it's better also to do it not sa public. Okay. So kay, ano lang po, um, Hey, Ambassador, uh, good afternoon. Sabi ni Winston Churchill, ang diplomacy is telling someone to go to hell in such a way that they will tell you and ask you for directions. And I just like to ask a simple question. Do you think that diplomacy is very challenging? Yes, sir. Yes. I really like that answer, Mr. Chair, because I think it's very challenging for her to accept questions from me and to be confirmed by you. <laughs> Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank I, you. Know. I also would like to give my full support to my kinakapatid. Um, she well deserves that position. I would just like to put on record when her mother was the president of the Republic of the Philippines, she, went, she had the top, she topped the career service exam, but because out of delicadeza, she did not join the DFA. She would have been a great ambassador at that time, and I'm happy that she's going to be a great ambassador for us in Austria. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Senator Talentino. <laughs> Sige. Luli, Luli. Luli was with me during that earthquake. Uh, I, I support her. But for another uh, career officer here, if I may, Mr. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, yeah, please. I'd like to express my full support. I don't know this uh, person from DFA to me, Ms. Christine Bautista Lagoros. Can you raise your hand uh, if you're virtually present? Alam niyo Maybe po, Ma'am, uh, you are the epitome of a Filipina fighter. I read your uh, profile. You started as a factory worker. Then later on, you became a call center agent. You attempted to become a nun. You entered the monastery. Muntik na po kayo maging madre. Nakikita ko po na ginuhit ng tadhana na talagang kayo ay magiging bahagi ng Department of Foreign Affairs. And I admire... Can you raise again your hand, ma'am? And you, and you battled and survived several health issues. 
with that, my full admiration, ma'am. You're based in Italy. You're more uh, blessed because that's a holy, almost holy land. So, Mr. President, I, I highlighted that because this lady deserves to be part of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Okay, Majority Leader. Uh, uh, Ambassador Roy, you can uh, take your seat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Majority Leader. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that the committee recommend to the plenary for the commission to give its consent to the nomination and to confirm the ad interim appointments of 60, not 61, foreign service officials as listed in the agenda, except Ambassador Manuel Antonio Javier Tihanki, not because we are opposed to you, Ambassador, but uh, some members would like to ask some policy questions. So, And uh, to assure the good gentleman, Ambassador, um, Majority Floor Leader, we just like to put uh, on record, Ambassador, you will be taken up on Tuesday. Tuesday at 1 o'clock. So don't worry. You will not be deferred. You will be taken up on Tuesday. That's a couple of our colleagues want to discuss a few issues on uh, WTO. Thank you. I still move, Mr. Chair. There is a motion to recommend to the plenary for the commission to give its consent to the nominations and to confirm the ad interim appointments of the following foreign service officials listed according to ranks and dates of complete submission of documentary requirements from the Department of Foreign Affairs. I will not mention all the names because I have mentioned it a while ago, except for Ambassador Manuel Antonio Javier T. Hanky. Mr. Chair, there will be no other matter to discuss. I move to adjourn the meeting. There being no other matters, uh, on motion of the majority leader, and Julie Scott, that there being no objection, the meeting is hereby adjourned.
adoption of the commission appointments in the first regular session of the 19th Congress is hereby called to order. May I call on Representative Greg Gasataya to lead the chamber in prayer. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another productive day for this august body and the blessings you keep showering us that we may continue to share with our fellow Filipinos. Thank you for this opportunity to be stewards of your will in appointing capable and deserving statesmen at the helm of our nation. May you also continue to guide the respective departments in pursuing the best interests of the public above all else. We ask you to bless us with open minds and open hearts so that we may fulfill the duties of this august body with utmost integrity and with only the most sacred consideration in mind, the welfare of the Filipino people. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Secretary, please call the roll of members. The Honorable Members of the Commission on Appointments, Marie Lourdes Nancy S. Binay, Virginel G. Biron, Alan Peter Compañero S. Cayetano, Joseph Victor G. Ejercito, Francis Chis G. Escudero, Jingoy Ejercito Estrada, Albert S. Garcia, Greg G. Gasataya, Christopher Bongo, Ramon N. Guico Jr., Risa Ontiveros, Loren Legarda, Oscar Oka G. Malapitan, Rodante D. Marcoleta, Aimi R. Marcos, Lani Mercado Revilla, Jose Gay G. Padjernos, Johnny T. Pimentel, Grace Poe, Jordine Jesus M. Romualdo, Manuel T. Sagarbaria, Francis Tol N. Tolentino, Luis Raymond L. Ray F. Villaferte Jr., present. Cynthia A. Villar. The chair is present. We have 21 persons present in the chamber and one of our colleagues online. With a total of 22 members, the chair declares the presence of a quorum. Majority Leader. Mr. Chair, I move to dispense with the reading of the journal of the plenary session held on November 29, 2022, and consider the same as approved. There being no objection to the motion of the majority floor leader, motion is approved. Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to consider the recommendation of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology on the ad interim appointment of Mr. Ivan John and Rili Uy as Secretary, Department of Information and Communications Technology. I so move, Mr. Chair. Before I act on that motion, I'll just make an appeal to our colleagues that uh, uh, we allow the sponsor, of course, to sponsor the measure and those who would like to co-sponsor, if they can make it very brief or if not, just just uh, uh, submit to the, to the chamber your official statement for the record to hasten the proceedings as my colleagues in the Senate who are not members of the CA are already asking for me to, to hurry it up. Thank you, Majority Leader. There being no objection to the motion, motion is approved. Mr. Chair, on behalf of the Chairperson of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology, Representative Manuel T. Sagarbaria, I move that Representative Greg G. Casataya be recognized to make the appropriate motion for the recommendation of the committee. There being no objection, we'd like to recognize Congressman Greg Casataya of Bacolod City. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, esteemed colleagues, good afternoon. For and on behalf of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology of the Commission of Appointments, as well as the Chairperson, uh, Honorable Chair, the Honorable uh, Congressman Chiquiting Sagarbaria, it is my honor and privilege to sponsor the nomination of the ad interim appointment of Mr. Ivan Jan Enrile Uy as Secretary of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. In the interest of time, Honorable Chair, uh, may we just uh, enter to the records of the Commission the sponsorship speech that was prepared by the good uh, Chairperson. Along that line, it is my honor and privilege to move for the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Mr. Ivan Jan Enrile Uy as Secretary of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. I so move, Honorable Chair. Mr. Chair, to second the motion, uh, Senator Lauren Legarda, Congressman Mondico, Congressman Johnny Pimentel, Congresswoman Lani Mercado Revilla, Senator Binay, Senator Jingoy Estrada, Senator Grace Po, and all other members who will wish to uh, second the motion will, uh, will just put their sponsorship and support for the records, Mr. Chair. And on the part of the majority, Mr. Chair, I move that the Commission confirm the ad interim appointment of Mr. Ivan John and Rili Uy as Secretary, Department of Information and Communications Technology. I so move, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, on the part of the minority, we fully support the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Secretary Ivan Uy. There being no objection and unanimous, <laughs> unanimously approved by the Commission, the ad interim appointment of Mr. John Ivan and Rili Uy as Secretary of the Department of Information and Communications Technology is hereby confirmed. Congratulations. Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to consider the recommendation of the Committee on Energy on the ad interim appointment of Mr. Rafael Perpetuo Mercado Rotilla as Secretary, Department of Energy. I so move, Mr. Chair. There being no objection, motion is approved. Mr. Chair, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on Energy, Senator Lauren Legarda, be recognized. Our distinguished colleague from the province of, Pan of uh, Antigua, the island of Panay, Senator Lauren Legarda, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, my dear colleagues, it is my honor and privilege to sponsor the confirmation of the ad interim appointment Thank of my Casimanwa, my fellow Antiqueño attorney, Rafael Perpetuo M. Lutilia as Secretary of the Department of Energy. Secretary Lutilia is one of the best legal minds around with a vast experience in energy policy formulation and regulation. He is a man of high integrity and a true professional. The energy sector is one that plays a vital role in accelerating the socioeconomic progress of our nation by ensuring that energy is accessible, sufficient, stable, and secure, while harnessing the private sector to play its role as an engine of growth. The position of secretary of this important sector thus requires someone who has deep knowledge of energy matters and the ability to face the challenges inherent in the job. It requires one with a strong political will and necessitates the tireless individual committed to the country's cause. Allow me to cite some of his achievements to show his credentials. Secretary Lotilia, former editor-in-chief of the UP Collegian, is one of the most hardworking and competent professionals who could provide the kind of governance necessary in shepherding the energy sector. As a simple and low-profile public servant, Secretary Lotilia, or simply Popo, to friends and contemporaries, is no stranger to the energy industry. He was chairman and CEO of the Power Sector Assets and Liabilities Management Corporation, government corporation tasked to manage the privatization of generation assets, IPP contracts, and other non-power assets, including the management of the financial obligations of NAPOCOR, NPC, and of course, a former energy secretary under the administration of then President Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo. He has served in government for more than 20 years in various capacities, first as a professor in our alma mater, University of the Philippines, in the College of Law, under Secretary of the National Economic Development Authority, NEDA, under three presidents, and as I mentioned earlier, Chairman and CEO of PISOM, besides sharing his expertise as legal consultant to several Senate presidents and senators. Today, Secretary Lutilia has already accomplished a number of significant policies which could help accelerate 
this administration's energy goal of moving towards a self-reliant and sustainable low carbon future and ensuring affordable energy access to our people. First, on renewable energy, more job opportunities for our people will be unlocked as he shepherds the opening up to 100% foreign ownership investments in the renewable energy sector. Cleaner air for the environment will be felt as the DOE increased from 1% to 2.52%. The utilization of renewable energy in on-grid areas where the country's exposure to price fluctuations in the global market will be minimized. The supply and delivery of electric power will be more stable and secure from international geopolitical tensions as the DOE worked hard to allow qualified and registered renewable energy generating units the preferential dispatch in the Wesem. We're also aware that the gentleman, of course, is from Sibalom Antique. Secretary Lutilia is now crafting a policy and administrative framework that will ensure the efficient and optimal development of one of the subsectors of renewable energy, offshore wind, as this government is receiving considerable interest to invest in offshore wind development. This is a new energy technology that countries in Asia Pacific and even Europe are developing while our country has great potential, both for offshore and onshore wind development. Shouldn't we be proud that as early as now, Secretary Lutilia is laying the foundation for the use of this new technology so that the next generation would no longer be burdened with having to experience the use of fossil fuels, which are the origin of greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming. Second, on the acceleration of alternative fuels for transport, we are seeing that the electric vehicle industry is gradually realizing its vision to modernize and electrify road transport in our country. During the last Congress, we passed Republic Act 11697, Electric Vehicle Industry Development Act. Now that the IRR has been promulgated, he is working to implement the vision of Congress to implement the fa and facilitate an enabling environment for the development of electric vehicles as a feasible mode of transport to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. He seeks to develop a comprehensive plan for the electric vehicle industry to generate demand for the transport sector consistent with the chairman's approach to cushioning the impact of higher fuel prices in the international market. Worthy of note is this urgent desire to stabilize the supply of electricity, particularly this coming summer, as the country faces the declining natural gas from the Malampaya Camago Reservoir. Secretary Lutilia is taking concrete steps towards realizing this goal by ensuring that there is enough capacity supplied through various sources, including the coordination, monitoring of the timely completion of the transmission lines to unlock stranded capacities. Mr. Chairman, on a lighter note, who would not recall Secretary Lutilia's frugal lifestyle, which was a legend at UP Dileman? Of course, I think he is way ahead of me. After all, he was already a professor then. It was his simple ways that were partly the reason why, as a professor at the UP College of Law, aspiring lawyers, many of whom are now of some of today's prominent lawyers and lawmakers, were inspired and even considered following his lead by embracing a vow of poverty. Until now, we see him as a very simple man with no taint of corruption issues, whose only desire is for our nation to have stable, secure, and sustainable energy to achieve higher economic growth and better economic opportunities for the population. Tignan po ang kanyang suot. Galing po yan sa weaving center na aking tinayo sa barangay Bagtason sa Bugasong Antique. Mr. Chairman, I am certain that most of us here are not aware that Secretary Lutilia is also a map collector. It is this passion that brought him to many places by keenly examining maps. Through these maps that he has collected, he has traveled to many places and through different periods in history. By collecting maps, he has discovered the mysterious life of the past, the undiscovered truths about the Philippines, the untold stories about our people. And so, why am I telling you all this? Will this make him more qualified to head the energy sector? Mr. Chairman, it tells us of his keen eye for details while remaining or retaining a broad view, a focus on the here and now, guided by a vision of what is to come. These indicate an ability to efficiently allocate his cognitive resources to achieve thoroughness and accuracy when accomplishing tasks. I believe that Secretary Lutilia is more than just 
hardworking, brilliant, and competent. He also has the merit and the fitness required for the position. Having said that, Mr. Chairman, my esteemed colleagues, I respectfully move for the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Attorney Rafael Perpetuo Mercado Lutilia from Sibalum Antique, my Casimanwa, wearing a barong made in the weaving center I set up, and whose grandfather, Macario Lutilia, was educated by my grandfather, who was his professor, who founded the first secondary school in Antique. My grandfather is the former governor, Vicente Helia. His grandfather is Macario Lutilia, whose classmate and best friend was also my grandfather, Bartolome Helia. So there are linkages, but I am not endorsing him because of those linkages. So may I move now for the confirmation of Secretary Lutilia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Chair, to second the confirmation, I would like to put on record that they will be submitting their sponsorship uh, message and speech, Congressman Mon Gico, Congressman Johnny Pimentel, Congressman Sagarbaria, Congressman Gazataya, Congressman Abit Garcia, Congressman Lani, Woman Lani Mercado Revilla, Senator Cynthia Villar, Congressman Oka Malapitan, Senator Jingoy Estrada, Senator Grace Po, uh, Congressman GP Padernas will be submitting their uh, support. Mr. Chair, on the part of the majority, would like to express to move the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Mr. Rafael Mercado Lotilia as Secretary, Department of Energy. I so move, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, on the part of the minority, we support the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Secretary Rafael Lotilia for the Department of Energy. Thank you. And before I act on the motion, I'd just like to say I had the opportunity of working with this gentleman as when I was a congressman on my third term and early on as my stint as senator. And I must say his credibility and integrity is beyond reproach and that uh, his heart is in the right place. And we wish him all the luck. Mr. And Chair, I would like to said, add also, I yes. forgot Senator Nancy Binay. Senator Nancy Binay is also added to the list. Yeah. And so we just like to say we, we give you our best and uh, we pray for your success, Secretary. With no other member wishes to uh, sponsor, and uh, by unanimous decision, the ad interim appointment of Mr. Rafael Perpetuo Mercado Lotilla, Secretary of the Department of Energy, is hereby confirmed. Congratulations, sir. Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to consider the recommendation of the Committee on Science and Technology on the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Umali Solidub, Jr. as Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. I so move, Mr. Chair. Hopefully this time there's no earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's no objection to the motion. Motion is approved. Mr. Chair, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on Science and Technology, Representative Oscar Oka G. Malapitan, be recognized. The distinguished gentleman from the city of Kalookan, Congressman Oka Malapitan, is recognized. Maraming salamat. Magandang magandang hapon po sa inyo, Mr. Chair, sa ating mga kasamahan sa Komisyon ng Panauhin. Akin pong karangalan na pangunahan ng pag-endorso sa pagkumpirma kay Dr. Renato U. Solidum Jr. bilang kalihim ng Department of Science and Technology. Sa simula pa lamang ng niyang kanang kanyang pagtatrabaho ay pinili na ni Secretary Solidum o Rene kung siya itawagin sa DOST kung saan siya ay nagsikap magtrabaho at magpakita ng kanyang angking galing at talino. Kung kaya't patuloy ang pag-angat ng kanyang posisyon nagsimula si Secretary Rene sa DOST pillbox kung saan ginampanan niya ang iba't ibang posisyon sa ahensya hanggat siya ay maging direktor nito noong 2003. Kung saan pinamahalaan niya ang ating mga ahensyang tumataguyod para sa pag-aaral ng siyensya. Disaster Risk and Reduction, Climate Change at Servisyong Pangagham at Teknolohiya. Si Secretary Rene din ang 
na nilbihan bilang undersecretary ng DOST bago siya anyayahan o imbitahan ni Pangulong Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos. Itong mga advokasya din na ang sinulong ni Secretary ne kahit na noong simula ng pandemya, sa kasaganaan ng pandemya, pinangunahan ni Secretary ne ang transformasyon ng mga aplikasyon para sa mga scholarship ng mga kabataan mula sa isang manual na proseso at ginawang ng online. Pati na din ang pamunuan ng mga virtual na pagdiriwang ng ating National Science and Technology Week. Nararapat ding ipagmalaki na kinilala ding eksperto si Secretary Rene sa ibang bansa. Ito'y makita sa mga panahon kung saan siya'y inanyayahan ng ilang mga international na mga komiteng tumatalakay sa siyensya ng iba't ibang organisasyon at asosasyon tulad ng United Nations, UNESCO, ASEAN at iba pa. Bilang pagkilala sa kanyang kontribusyon sa siyensya at serbisyo publiko, ilang beses na din ginawaran ng iba't ibang parangal si Secretary Rene. Ang ilan sa mga ito ay ang Presidential Citation for Public Service, ang Presidential Lingkod Bayan Award ng Civil Service Commission, ang Professional of the Year sa larangan ng Helohia at Professional Regulation Commission, ang Excellence Award for Government Service ng Philippine Federation of Professional Association at ang Presidential Career Executive Service Award ng Career Executive Service Board. Ako mismo ay testigo sa galing at malasakit ni Secretary Rene. Ipinagmamalaki ko na si Secretary Rene at ang DOST ay kasama at kabakas namin sa unang distrito ng Kaloocan. Pinanguna ng DOST at ni Secretary Rene kasama ang lungsod ng Kaloocan ang ilang mga programang nilayon para sa sap pag-unlad ng kinauupaan ng aming nasasakupan katulad ng Small Enterprise Technology Upgrading Program o Setup ang Bigay Buhay Multipurpose Cooperative na isang programang isusulong ang oportunidad magtrabaho ng mga mamayan na may kapansanan. Pinigyan din ni Sekretary Rene at ang DOS ang lungsod ng Kaloocan ng mga kagamitan para sa solid waste management and urban agriculture and enhanced nutri nut nutriban technology para sa aming mga mag-aaral at Starbuck para sa mga paaralan at aklatan. Ikinagagala ko ding i-anunsyo na ang Regional Science and Technology Week ay ginanap sa University of Caloocan ngayong Disyembre. Ito yung mga programa na nais at patuloy na isulong ni Sekretary Rene sana'y makarating lahat sa iba't ibang parte ng ating bansa. Lahat ito ay nagawa at patuloy na isinulong ni Sekretary Rene sa loob ng kanyang 38 taon ng paninilbihan. Kung kaya't buong puso kong pinangunahan ang kumpirmasyon ni Dr. Renato U. Solidum Jr. bilang kalihim ng Department of Science and Technology. Mr. Chair, to second uh, the motion, the seconding speech of the following will just be uh, submitted for the records of the Commission. Senator Loren Ligarda, Congressman Mongico, Congressman Abit Garcia, Senator Jingoy Estrada, Congresswoman Lani Mercado Rivilla, Senator Cynthia Villar, Senator Nancy Binay, Senator Grace Po, Congressman Gasataya, Congressman Johnny Pimentel, Congressman GP Padernos, Mr. Chair, uh, on the part of the majority, we would like to move the confirmation, the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Omali Solidum as Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. So move, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, on the part of the minority, we support the nomination 
or rather the confirmation of the ad interim appointment of Secretary Renato Solidum as Secretary of Department of Science and Technology. And before I act on the motion, I would just like to say, I think no other person is fit for the job except our top scientist himself. And I'm glad that he rose from the ranks as, a member, as the head now of the Department of Science and Technology, being the head once upon a time of VVOX and other agencies of government uh, handling science and technology. And uh, maybe he might become a future, future national scientist. So with that, there being no objection and fully endorsed by all our members, the ad interim appointment of Mr. Renato Umali Solidum Jr. as Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology is hereby confirmed. Congratulations, sir. Mr. Leader. Mr. Chair, may we now proceed to consider the recommendation of the Committee on Foreign Affairs on the nominations and ad interim appointments of 60 foreign service officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs. There being no objection, motion is approved. We recognize Senator Jingo Estrada, sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable members of the Commission on Appointments, this representation as chairperson of the Committee on Foreign Affairs presided over public hearing this afternoon to deliberate on the nominations and ad interim appointments of 60 officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Your committee determined that they are all fit and qualified and ruled to recommend their nominations and ad interim appointments to the plenary for the approval of this August body. Leon Maria Guerrero, Philippine ambassador from 1962 to 1980 said, and I quote, there is no nationalist more fervent than the expatriate who sees his nation with all the enchantment lent by distance and absence. And there is no expatriate more nationalist than an ambassador of whom it might be said that he is almost a nationalist by occupation, a professional nationalist. Distinguished colleagues, I am honored to sponsor the nominations of the exemplars of such fervent nationalism and love of country as I recommend that this body give it its consent to the nominations of the following officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs, led by, number one, former Foreign Affairs Secretary, Teodoro, Teodoro Lopez Luxin, Jr., diplomat extraordinaire, one of the brightest and independent minds this country has ever produced, and for whom I am very much tempted to deliver a separate sponsorship speech, if only we have more time. Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, with concurrent jurisdiction over Ireland, Isle of Man, Bailiwick of Jersey, and Bailiwick of Guernsey, with the salary and emoluments of a Chief of Mission, Class 1. Number two, Jaime Adriano Flor Cruz, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the People's Republic of China, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Mongolia with the salary and emoluments of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Maria Andrelita Sacramento Austria, Chief of Mission Class 1, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Canada. Number 4, Evangelina Lourdes Arroyo Bernas, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Republic of Austria with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Croatia, Republic of Slovenia, and Slovak Republic, with the salary and emoluments of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Number five, Milen J. Garcia Albano, non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Marshall Islands, in addition to being ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to Japan, with the salary and emoluments of a Chief of Mission Class 1. Number 6, Jaime Victor Badillo Leda, as Chief of Mission Class 1, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Commission of the European Communities and the Council of the European Union, in addition to being Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Belgium, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Number 7, Celeste Vinson Balatbat, Chief of Mission Class 2, 
as ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to the Republic of Chile with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Ecuador and the Republic of Peru. Number eight, Roberto Gutierrez Manalo, Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Islamic Republic of Iran, with concurrent jurisdiction over the Republic of Turkmenistan and the Republic of Uzbekistan. Number nine, Belinda Mariano Ante, Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the, to the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste. Number 10, Leo or Leo Tito Lunar Ausan Jr., Chief of Mission Class II, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the People's Republic of Bangladesh, with concurrent jurisdiction over the, over the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka and the Republic of Maldives. Number 11, Jose Almodawar Cabrera III, Chief of Mission Class II as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the State of Kuwait. Number 12, Maria Agnes Maglasang Cervantes, Chief of Mission Class II as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Islamic Republic of Pakistan with concurrent jurisdiction over the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan the Greeks Republic and the Republic of Tajikistan. Good luck, ma'am. Number 13, Anne Halandoon Luis, Chief of Mission Class Two, as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Kingdom of Bahrain. I so move, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, to second the motion, uh, the following, uh, Members of the Commission of Appointments would like to submit their secondary speeches to support the nominations and their consent to the 61 of 60 officials of the DFA. Congressman uh, Ramon Gico with special uh, message of support to Ambassador Luli Arroyo Bernas. Congressman Abed Garcia. Congressman Pimentel with special uh, message of support sponsorship and support to uh, Ambassador Luli Arroyo Bernas, Senator Nancy Binay, Senator Grace Po with special uh, message of support to Ambassador Luxin, and uh, Senator uh, J.V. Ejercito Estrada with a special mention of support to S Ambassador Teddy Boy Luxin. Uh, on the part of the majority, Mr. Chair, we give its consent to the nomination and confirmation of the ad interim appointments of 60 foreign service officials mentioned in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Sorry. Sorry. Would like to uh, correct. We just like to give its consent to the nomination and confirmation of the ad interim appointments of eight, seven. 13 ambassador positions, as mentioned by the chairman of the Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs. I so move, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, on the part of the minority, we support the confirmation of the attentive appointment of the 13 ambassadors of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And I'd like to add uh, to our colleagues, to our ambassadors, you are the face of our country in all your posts abroad. Please uh, make us proud and help promote our nation. It's a great nation. I hope you can get more tourists to come and more investors to invest in our country. So mabuhay po kayong lahat. And there being no objection to your appointment with unanimous approval, the commission hereby gives its consent to the nomination of the ad interim appointments of 13 ambassadorial positions of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Hereby confirmed and approved. Congratulations. Mr. Chair, I move that the chairperson of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Senator Jingoy Ercio Estrada, be again recognized. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Distinguished sponsors recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distingu distinguished colleagues, it is my privilege and honor as your chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs to recommend that this body also confirm the ad interim appointments of the following officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Number one, Kyra 
Kyra Christian Danganan Asusena, Chief of Mission Class 1. Please raise your hand if your if your name is mentioned. Those who are participating virtually. Enrique Trinidad Foss, Chief of Mission Class 1. Herminia Velasco Aguilar Usudan, Chief of Mission Class 2. Lolita Bugnot Capco, Chief of Mission Class 2. Laila Castillon Laura Santos, Chief of Mission Class 2. Conrado Batara Demdem Jr., Career Minister. Pamela Fresdido Durian Bailon, Career Minister. Ruel Urmeneta Gunabe, Career Minister. Susana Maria Lopez Mendiola, Career Minister. Greg Marie Concha Marino, Career Minister. Shirley Liwanag Flores, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Christine Bautista Laguros, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Cecil Joyce Yap Lau, For Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Andrea Bungaling Laicano, Foreign Service, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Monica Camille Bacani Limpo, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Rowena Rivera Pangilinan Dakipil, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Robert De Class Quintin, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Fatima Guzman Quintin, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Luningning Kamoying Valdez, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Andre Peter Kabuay Estanislao, Foreign Service Officer Class 1. Mylene Marqueses Acosta, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Andrea Cristina Quinto Caimo Kauhanen, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Benjamin Aligado Celedio Jr., Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Jonathan Andrew Dichinko Chua, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Stephanie Alexis Arejola Cruz, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Laureen Damasin Takanay, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Janelle John Santos Domingo, Foreign, Services, so Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Anna Marie May Ramos Guerra, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Charleston Carolino Hermosura, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. An Anwar Makatembel Ito, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Elaine May Laruan Hernandez, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Von Ryan Gasmenya Pangwi, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Majelia Chris Christi Uy Puwa Diesmos, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Judy Boydon Razon, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Noel Loreto Rodriguez, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. John Paul Tapia Samonte, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Liza Maria Salazar Viejo, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Mar Marianne Intal Bringas, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Mary Grace Luza Perpetua, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Mark Theodore Palacios Benigno, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Von Ryan Saltin Ferreira, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. John Michael Bansil Gomez, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Miguel Carlo Narzo Hornilla, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Jacqueline Joan Santiago Arquisa, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Andrea Lynn Nicolas Lazaro, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. Christian Sen Dicolen Cabajo, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. And finally, Jet Sarah Olfato, Foreign Service Officer Class 2. I so move, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Members of this commission will just submit their uh, seconding speech as uh, to second uh, and confirm the, their consent for the nominations. On the part of the majority, Mr. Chair, we give its consent to the nomination and confirmation of the ad interim appointments of the Chief of Missions, Foreign Service Officers, Cadre Ministers, as enumerated by uh, the Chairman of the Committee, Senator Jingoy. I so move. How many were they? 57. 57. 47. 47. 47. Mr. Chair, on the part of the minority, we fully support the confirmation of the ad interim appointments of the 47 foreign service officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Well, there being no objection to the motion and all unanimously uh, supported by our colleagues, the Commission hereby gives its consent to the nomination and confirms the ad interim appointment of 47 foreign service officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chair, there being no other matter to discuss, I move to adjourn.
Before we adjourn, we'd just like to ask the secretaries to join us after which the foreign affairs officials. Uh, there being no objection to the motion, the session is adjourned. <laughs>